second. I'm already here. Okay, here we go. And uh, let me just test. Let's check. I'm by myself here. I don't have a team of people, so. Oh, same, same here, oh, man. Here <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we are. Yeah, we're on. Let me just test. Let's check. I'm by myself. I don't have a team of people, so. Oh, same, same here. Okay, good. <laughs> Take a sound check. Okay. Awesome. There we go. And people are starting to log in. All right. Greetings, friends. Uh, welcome to the live stream. My name is Peter Salemi, uh, president of the BICOG. And as promised, we have here Mario Shepard. He calls himself on YouTube the Biblical Binatarian. Uh, Mario, welcome to the program. Thanks for doing this. Oh, no, thank you, Peter. Glad to be here. And we already had someone welcoming us, welcoming us uh, to the live stream. Uh, Rado IG, I guess I'll just pronounce it that way. Uh, thanks for joining the live stream. And uh, hopefully people start to pour in. Uh, and we're going to have a discussion on who, what is God, the, the case for biblical binatarianism. And uh, like I was talking to Mario before we went live, I, I went to your YouTube channel a few months ago. Because I was searching for binatarians and you came up at the top of the list. And I was watching your videos. I thought they were fantastic. Oh, Some definitely. of the arguments you put up for the, the case for binatarianism, which is the duality of the Godhead of the Father and the Son. Mm. Right. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that, Peter, actually. I much appreciate it. Now, I understand you were a Trinitarian at first. So what led you to become a binatarian? Oh, wow. I, I will. Uh, <laughs> I'll give you the short story. Um, okay. I actually uh, I, I never expected to be become a binatarian. This is like the last thing I thought I would ever be. Uh, I was a very happy Trinitarian. I was actually a Trinitarian minister. I had served as assistant pastor, youth pastor. Uh, I was assistant to the pastor, and I was in the process of being groomed to become a pastor. Um, and I'd done missionary work, evangelist, apologist, you name it. Um, I've, I've served the Lord my whole life because he's been a wonderful savior. And I've always been a Bible base believer right you know my you know most of the people who know me you know even when i was a trinitarian i was known that when i go into the pulpit i put my finger on the text and i don't lift it off until i leave the uh the pulpit uh meaning right. you're going to get the word and you know so i've always you know really sought to honor god in his word and i'm actually going to shock you i actually was attempting to prove the trinity and i've often said uh, on my channel that the quickest way to disprove the trinity is actually to attempt to prove it to sincerely <laughs> yeah and substantively sit down and say, let's write down all the claims. Not just, you know, uh, God is, you know, the, the Holy Spirit is God, the Son is God, the Father, no, 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 no. Let's write down all the claims and let's go through scripture and let's honestly, transparently say what the Bible does and does not say. And I was prepared to know that, you know, I knew that some things wouldn't be there. Um, I tried for years, I tried for years. And the conclusion that I came to that jumped out at me is, it's very clear about the father and the son. That's right. super clear. It's yeah, clear that there's no the mistake father is spirit. Yeah. yeah, the father is spirit and the Lord Jesus Christ is spirit. You know, uh, you know, one and the same spirit, uh, not multiple spirits, but one spirit. And I said, maybe the Bible has been telling us all along. Um, and I remember actually one day, which put it over the top, that I was at home. I was, I was actually at home sick from church <laughs> one day, which is rare for me. <laughs> And I was studying and then the thought ran into my mind. It's like, you know, Adam and Eve were two, but yet they were united as one flesh, you know, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, God made them uh, in his image and the image of God. He made him in the image of God. He made them. And I said, you know, what if God is, you know, is two or two who are united as one spirit, just as Adam and Eve are two who are united as one flesh. That would definitely be in God's image. Obviously, you know, it's not perfect because we're talking, you know, uh, we're, we're, you know, we're in the human, uh, we're creation, but. Mm -hmm. That thought landed in my head. And, you know, I've had thoughts like that before. And I, I always respond by just going to the scripture, finding passages and, you know, say, OK, that was a that was a foolish thought. That thought would not leave. And when I went to the passages that I had commonly used to teach the Trinity, I was dismantling them myself. And and I, I felt, you know, I was at that point And I said, if I'm going to actually be faithful to my conscience and say I'm going to follow the Bible wherever it leads, and I clearly can disprove this and I have something better and a biblical, more biblical alternative. 
then I said, I'm going to honor Christ and whatever comes, comes. And um, right. as you can imagine, um, it was a difficult decision, but I look back now 20 years, 20 plus years, it was one of the best decisions that I'd ever made. Because it gives you clarity of who, <laughs> what God is. And there's no doubt in your mind, right? Oh, I mean, man. and you, you said you were... Preaching to the choir. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> and you said you were an apologist. That's that's one who be, comes to the defense of yeah. the Trinity. Absolutely. And you just yeah. gave that up. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll tell you, I, I was known, uh, whether it be on my college campus, even post, I, I, I work with college ministries. Uh, when they, you know, it'd be nothing for them to have a, an event, call me in and say, hey, we want, we have an audience filled with students or, you know, university students, and you're going to take on some of the toughest topics, right? Some of the toughest topics. And they're going to ask you questions. I love that. That was my gift. That still is, right? Um, and I love it because, and the reason why I love it, because the Lord Jesus's word will never fail. Mm -hmm. And when you have that as your foundation, I just like just study and just say what Jesus said and know it well enough where I'm not guessing or where I'm humble enough to say what I don't know. And but as an apologist, I had defended the Trinity multiple. You know, I, I remember being a missionary in Africa and having to defend it there, being asked about the Trinity. I obviously have done it in the U.S. and other places. Um, and I knew the illustrations. I knew what it should illustrations to avoid. And I had, you know, when I say uh, apologists, I mean, I read the books. I read the, right. the top books of apologists. I knew the correct formulations. I read the ancient church history uh, uh, writings, you know, Tertullian. I, I would sit during my lunch break reading Tertullian or Jonathan Edwards, or other people of that nature. Um, you out, John Owen, John, you name it, all the Johns. I read them all. Um, Augustine, you know, and, and you know, you know, they would have great, you know, you, while you're reading it, you're like, oh, wow, I'm convinced of it. But then you get into the Bible. And I think, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, Peter, that constant studying, every book of the Bible, all 66 books on their own, beginning, in, beginning with Moses, going all the way to John in Revelation, and getting the language, the logic, and, and learning how to hear them in their own voice, it, the Trinity is not there. And mm -hmm. and and I'm more. And Twenty years later, I'm even more convinced. Right. And speaking of Tertullian, he's the one that came up with the word Trinitas, yeah, the Latin theology Trinitas, right? Yeah. He he actually. Um, I have a love hate relationship with Tertullian. Um, <laughs> He is a he was a lawyer. He was a lawyer and he used a lot of terminology. And it's funny, he has he's known for this famous quote quotation where he says, What does Jerusalem have to do with Athens? Meaning, you know, what do we what, what does the Bible have to do with Greek philosophy? This is one of the greatest ironies in the church. His terminology that he introduced to the church have had more lasting impact on the church than anything. That, you know, and I would say a lot of stuff that should have come out of Jerusalem, he's basically introduced a lot of that Greek philosophy that you have. And and by the way, I, a lot of terminology that people use to this day, persons, right? Um, mm -hmm. The way that they use it today is based off of Tertullian's usage that then got refined throughout the years. But he has a lot. I mean, in fact, he has the I would say he has the patent to a lot of the terms that we still that people still use today uh, when talking about the Trinity. And by the way, he was not an exegete. He was not he was not a rock solid. Let's get into the word. Let's get into the text type of guy. He was very much a proof texter. He was a lawyer. And you can see it in a lot of his terminology that he's looking for legal terms and other terms. And ironically, one part in church history, he actually got dismissed for some of his beliefs because he just kept going and going and going. And he was a guy with a lot of speculation. Uh, and so there was a big point in church history where they really wouldn't even quote him because of some of his other problematic beliefs. So uh, unfortunately, uh, I, I'll give I'll give a, I'll give a, um, a classic example. He, he taught that, you know, we shouldn't get married as Christians. Um, oh, yeah. And, yeah. I mean, I mean, like, you know, I mean, do I have to even open up the Bible to disprove this guy? <laughs> right, um, right. And, and and interesting is that the Catholic Church teaches that priests should not get married. They should stay single. They're married to Christ. Yeah, it's it's and that that's that's what I would say, Peter. I and this I, I'll tell you what is actually I, I'm 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 a um a really broken hearted Bible believing preacher, man. I I love the Lord Jesus Christ. He saved me when I was a young child. He changed my life. Give me Jesus or let me go. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I love the Lord. Right. The, there's no one like Christ. And when I look at what many of these teachers have done with the Bible. See, by being a member of that quote unquote fraternity, right? Being a preacher, being a few pastors and, and hearing and I'm hearing these arguments I'm hearing and I'm like, that's that's not solid. 
I know pastors. I know pastors. I mean, I know I have lots of pastors who are my friends, guys who I grew up with that are pastors. They can't they can't defend the Trinity, but they right. teach it. And they, I, I've even had some tell me I can't teach what you're teaching because I will lose my job. But yep, they can't defend fact, yeah. what they're teaching. And most of them don't really teach it that often when you start counting numbers. Right. My joke is if you ever want to avoid hearing the Trinity, go to a Trinitarian church because you won't hear it that often. Right. You may hear a few words, you know, one, you know, God, our father, his son and the Holy Spirit. And they kind of walk off at that. But you won't hear them teach it and defend it. And when they do, there's a lot of hesitation. There's a lot of stuttering. There's a lot of, um, you know, uh, qualifications. And I know this is difficult. And, and 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 I think you probably and you said it earlier about clarity. I like when I can just pick up a verse, name name a, name a New Testament writer. In fact, let's go to the Old Testament. You know, Psalm one hundred and ten. You know, let's you know, David would say what we're saying. Exactly. And it's clear. It, it it's it's clearer than clear. And and for me, that that has been just the the great confirmation. And I'll, I'll say this to you, and I'm assuming you know this as well. The Bible is overwhelmingly clear. I know sometimes people say, oh, there's so many different ways to interpret the Bible. There's so many ways to interpret it wrongly if you don't heed the signposts. But God did not give us his word to confuse us. Right. He gave us listen, the secret things of the Lord belong to the Lord. But what he has revealed belong to us and our children, not the theologians, our children from from youngest age to oldest age. And we're to teach them. And he is to give us clarity. Now, what God has not revealed is none of my business. But what he has, that belongs to me. And I will not let any preacher, teacher, theologian dilute or misdirect what Jesus has said because he's my final authority. And I hold to his clarity. And that, and by the way, that's what gives me my confidence and makes me go back into uh, the arena to debate these guys. And it's interesting what you said about uh, being uh, the revelation, God being revealed. Now, mm. here's an interesting quote I want to give you from uh, Dr. Robert Morey, who's ah. a Trinitarian <laughs> apologist, sure. something that you used to be. And he says this on page 483. He gave me this book, The Trinity Evidence and Issues. And he says, uh, Trinitarians readily admit that the Trinity is beyond our finite capacity to understand or explain him in an exhaustive sense. And then he says, mm. obviously... No one can explain why or how God is what he is. He existed long before we were around, and he is, he is what he is, regardless whether we can fully understand or explain him. Now, that, for me, goes contrary to what the Bible says, because I'll just read you just a couple of quotes. And I know you quoted uh, Matthew eleven twenty seven as well. Uh, Jeremiah nine twenty four mm. says, uh, Let him that glorieth, glorieth in this. That he understandeth and knoweth me that I am Yahweh. And then Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27, it says, No man knoweth the uh, Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son. And he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. It is rev a revelatory knowledge. Amen. Yet Trinitarians say that uh, we can't understand God. I mean, that goes just contrary to Scripture, doesn't it? Amen. Amen. As I like to say, uh, amen times two on that one. Um, I, I would tell you, Peter, and let me let me let me I'm going to take it up a notch. And I know I know uh, I know you'll agree with this one. Um, there is scarcely a page. In the New Testament. In which you cannot turn and see that revelation of the father and the son. Mm -hmm. It's a family relationship. Yes, right? exactly. And. When it comes to family, God did not want us guessing. He wanted us to know 100% who he is, who his son is, that we may have a fellowship with them, right? I'll give you two verses, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but John 17, 3, you cannot be a bonitarian and not smile when you quote this verse, because it says, the Lord Jesus Christ praying to the Father. Notice, no theologians are there, no, you know, he's talking directly to the Father, and he says, and this is eternal life, that they know you. They know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Right now, if Jesus is telling us that's what eternal life is, then we have to be able to know God and know the one whom He has sent, the Lord Jesus Christ. The second one that I love to quote, and like I said, our biggest problem as Bonitarians is we have so many texts. Right, the, the, <laughs> the Trinitarians have their dozens of proof texts. We have our thousands of truth texts. 
right? Right. So first John one, three, John says, you know, and what we have heard, it was seen and heard, we declare to you that you may have fellowship with us. That's John writing later as an apostle to people who weren't there when Christ was walking around. And he says, what we've seen and heard, we, we proclaim to you so that you may have fellowship with us. And then he says, in our fellowship, indeed, not possibly, not maybe, no, indeed is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that your joy may be complete. And, and as, as a, as a bonitarian, I like to say, John didn't have two thirds joy. His joy was complete. His fellowship was with the father and the son. Right. And obviously my Trinitarian friends have to go and try to race and find some proof text to get around that clarity, but that's clarity. When I was a Trinitarian minister, I remember those verses, those verses used to trouble me because I said, God, why, why didn't you write a verse like that for the Trinity? All we needed is just John just to keep going or Paul to keep going. Right. But to my point, to your point, God wants us to have fellowship with him and with each other. And that's centered around the father and the son. There is no ambiguity in the Bible on that point. And even if you look at the salutations of Paul, they're all dual. <laughs> uh, greetings from the father and, and the son, Jesus Christ, just constantly in every, in every letter. It's always a dual uh, salutation of the father and the son. There's no, there's no third Amen. And, amen. Amen. As I say, but, as, on my channel, I like to, to end by always saying grace and peace times two. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'll actually, I'll one up you, uh, Peter, um, on that one. I went a few years ago and I did, a, I was doing a video on those, you know, Paul's greetings. Cause I, I did a whole video on seven reasons why Paul's a bonitarian, right? And on the greetings, I was just going through and I saw something that blew me away even further. Now here's, 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 here's something else. Not only does he say grace and peace to, you know, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, and you see that in his letters, what you find is Paul has three things that he does in every one of his introductions. He gives his apostolic credentials, Paul, apostle, and then he greets the church to the church at, to the saints at, the church in God, you know, God, and then he gives that grace and peace. So the grace and peace is usually third. What you'll find is in if most, if not all of his letters, at least in one of those three statements, he says something bonitarian. And most of them, he says something bonitarian in the first and something in the last or something in the middle. Here's a few letters where he says something bonitarian in each one of those three, right? I'll give uh, 1 Corinthians as an example, or Romans 1 as an example, where he, he's Paul, an apostle of, of, of Christ Jesus by the will of God, right? And then he says, to the church who is in Christ Jesus through God our Father. And then he'll say, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I just want to pause. Just in the first three verses, our first few verses, you're like, Paul is very intentionally, and I mean, I, I, some, some of my friends say, Mario, you, 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 you're not subtle. You're very, very direct, very <laughs> blunt. And, and I say, I feel in good company with Paul. He knew how to talk about what he believed. And from the very first statement, whether it be his own apostolic authority, whether it be the position of the church being in God and in Christ or the grace and peace that comes from God, our father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. He did not have any ambiguity. And as you pointed out correctly, you will not see where he does that with the third in any one of those three statements. Mm -hmm. And when you said about John 17, even at the end of first John, he says again, the same thing. And, and he says, this yeah. is the true God and eternal life. Amen. Talking Amen. about Jesus Christ. So, I mean, they, these, these guys, the apostles, were not confused. Not they knew all. exactly not what all. God was. It was a duality of Godhead, yeah. a family of the Father and the Son. I mean, it was just Amen. very, very clear. Um, we we now, can just to add one quick note on yeah. those, those greetings. I've, as you can see, I've, I, you know, I'm, I'm in my element now. I'm talking to you, so I feel great. <laughs> I'm, used to having, I'm used to having lopsided conversations where, where right. Trinitarians will hear this evidence and they'll look like they, they can't acknowledge it on their faces. <laughs> but all of the apostles do it, by the way. James does it. Jude does It's the father and the son. Grace and peace to you. John does it. Most people forget that in John's letters, obviously I just quoted 1 John 1, 3, but when he get, writes 2 John and 3 John, it's grace and peace to you from God our father and Jesus Christ, his son in truth, right? Uh, James does it. Peter does it. Paul does it. I'm like, wait a minute. That, 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 in fact, that's one. Of, and if you point out what the New Testament writers do so overwhelmingly consistently, that can't be unclear when they do something like that so uniformly, right? And, and by the way, they, they have different styles, right? James doesn't write like Peter and, and John. You know, John definitely has his own style. 
but they all they all hit that greeting of grace and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And and obviously, I would even say you know, uh, the unknown writer of Hebrews, whoever wrote Hebrews, you know, you know, just take the whole book because they're definitely talking about God and Christ all throughout. But that that intro, when you see how they start with those introductions, they're focused on those two. And to me, that's that's New Testament apostolic Christianity. And yeah. we have a lot of support for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, it's interesting. Um, the seventh day churches of God are True. mostly binatarian. Yes. And I, I was wondering, do you belong to any of these seventh day churches of God or? I do not. I do not. I get I, okay. because of my channel, I get a lot of interaction from them. So some of them may be watching now from my channel. Yep. So uh, <laughs> greetings to you guys. Thanks for joining. They're always uh, good friends. Um, so I see the spectrum. I, I'm not personally part of the uh, the Church of the Seventh Day. I'll, I'll be honest with you. Actually, I didn't even know about the Church of the Seventh Day um, oh, really? that they were binatarian until after I became one and I started looking around. And so I always extend you know opportunities and offers of fellowship and engagement. But I'm not a member. I'm actually, uh, you know, you know, the, the church that I'm in is not actually um, is not uh, part of their denomination. I see. I, I wanted to ask because, like I said, yeah. the majority of the Church of God Seventh Day, which came out of the Adventists, who are, of course, yeah. Trinitarian, mm -hmm. sure. the majority of them and their offshoots are mainly binatarian. Church of God mm -hmm. International, Church of God mm -hmm. Seventh Day, all these people. So that's why I asked. I was just curious. So, sure. Um, now, there are other beliefs besides the Trinity. There's Unitarians, the Oneness, sure. Pentecostals. Uh, can you explain some of their beliefs of what they believe in of the Father and the awesome. Son? Awesome. By the way, if you don't mind, I didn't ask you this before, but I have a oh. book over my shoulder here, Why I Became a Biblical Bonitarian. I actually go through some of these topics. And what it is, it's just me just explaining my journey. I actually wrote it for my wife because she became a Bonitarian after I did. And she would ask me lots of questions. And I know she's watching, got a lot of love for her. But she would challenge, you know, like, hey, what about this verse? Or what about this passage? And I was like, man, it'd be great if I could give you a book. And I searched and I didn't find any. Uh, so I said, I want to write one where it's accessible and yet substantive and one I felt conscientious. In the book, I actually go through, you know, talk about the different beliefs of Unitarians, Trinitarians, etc. So let's go through. If you really break it down, Trinitarians on one side, obviously, one God, three persons. Uh, one They're subject has three persons. And then over yeah. here, Unitarianism, really, I always say you can you can kind of divide it three ways. One, you have basic level Unitarians who believe that Jesus is human and that's all Jesus is. Jesus is exclusively human. Uh, in fact, on this side, really, the Unitarians really divide based on their view of Jesus. So you have basic okay. level Unitarians who says God the Father is the ultimate true God. Jesus Christ is only a man. And obviously, you can already guess which passages they would quote. Um, and I address that in my book. Um, and then there's what we call the, you know, Unitarians who are Aryans. Uh, sometimes you, you encounter yeah. Jehovah Witnesses. But by the way, yeah. Jehovah Witnesses are not the only Aryans. I, I know some other Aryans who are out there that are, you know, non-Jehovah Witnesses and they are Aryans. Uh, and, and they run a, a, a spectrum, but they believe that Christ was created as the first of God's work before the foundation of the world. Um, and then you have oneness who actually believe that Jesus is the father. Really, they're, they're not two. And they believe when you talk about son, you're only referring to his humanity, him being in the incarnation, the father, you know, or I would say God becoming incarnate, taking on the humanity. And they say sonship is is it really the manifestation of God in the flesh. Um, and there weren't two together, loving each other, knowing each other, indwelling each other before the foundation of the world. Mm -hmm. As a Bonitarian, I, I'll tell you this, when I when I rejected the Trinity, um, a lot of it was due to arguments from the Unitarians, the, the basic level Unitarians, the Arians, and even the Oneness. Uh, they're really good at taking the Trinity apart. In fact, I've often yeah. said the reason why a number of those views exist is because Trinitarians assume that they win by default. They assume that, hey, well, we have answers for them, so therefore the Trinity, and they haven't heard a sufficient alternative. And most of them, when they do hear about Bonitarianism, they'll say, that's better than the Trinity. I've had Unitarians who, who never give a compliment to anyone. <laughs> My joke is basic level Unitarians never give a compliment to anyone, right? But they'll say, what your view is, it's better than the Trinity. Uh, because they recognize the Trinity is not there, and we can actually answer a number of their objections that they have. Well, what I find interesting about, uh, I was watching one of your videos, and you made a good point. You said that 
when it comes to binatarianism, we have all the strengths mm. of both arguments of the Trinity and their arguments when it comes to the deity of Christ. Yeah. And then we have some of the strong arguments of the Unitarians. We have it both in binatarianism, which I, I found a, a great what you said there in, in one of your Thanks. videos. That was, that was a good point. Thanks. By the way, I, I believe that that is, uh, and I, I'll say this, uh, Peter, um, one of the things that encourages me is once I rejected the doctrine of the Trinity, I said, hey, I don't want to do this again. I don't want to I don't want to go and find a belief and then find another. I said, I want to go back to bedrock. And I had to conscientiously look and say, hey, if I had to stand for the Lord Jesus Christ, what would I say that I believe? And I said, if you can't quote Jesus back to Jesus, you're already wrong. <laughs> you're already I mean, something's wrong with your argument. Right. And I said, what did he say? What did he say? Yeah. And I'll tell you this, each view has a little bit of the truth, right? Each view has, you know, the, the Trinitarians have some things that they're right on, right? Mm -hmm. um, like you said, the deity of Christ. In fact, I, I would argue most Trinitarians believe the Trinity because of the deity of Christ. Uh, that's true historically. That's true presently. Uh, on my channel, when I say I don't believe in the Trinity, they say, what do you mean? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And I was like, you're not talking to a Unitarian. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> or, or he says, let us make man in our image. And I'm like... You're not talking to a Unitarian. I, I, I believe in the Father and the Son. I'm in the image of God and his Son. Uh, hallelujah. But what they mean by Trinity, in fact, what they mean 99% of the time in their books, right? So I, I went and I started reading, you know, going back and digesting their books, right? Mm -hmm. Like this one by Robert Lethem. Um, here's a Trinitarian scholar, right? He's considered one of the best in the world, living. Robert Lethem, right? Um, he's, I believe he's European. Um, and he has a section, he goes through, but he has uh, about the history, the biblical arguments, his section, Peter, on the Holy Spirit. You know what it, it begins with? It begins by talking about the bonitarianism of the New Testament. It says, in fact, when you actually go to that section, on, he, he does Jesus and the Father. He has a chapter on that. And then he has a section on the Holy Spirit, chapter three. And the beginning, the first thing he says when he begins that chapter, I almost fell out of my chair. This, and by the way, this book is thicker than mine. So this guy is yeah. a scholar, right? He knows Hebrew and Greek. He knows the history. The first sentence is explicit bonitarianism and implicit Trinitarianism. And then he proceeds for the next several pages to give all the bonitarian passages in the Bible. And he says, this sounds pretty bonitarian. I didn't, I hadn't read that when I was a Trinitarian. I didn't, I never heard anyone say that. I didn't know that was an option. And I'm reading his book as a bonitarian. I was like, well, they don't teach this out loud, but the point is what they really are doing is protecting the deity of Christ and his distinction from the father. You know, they say Jesus prays and the father's there. And so they want to protect that. But then 381 comes along and they 381 AD comes along and they add in the Holy Spirit and the spirit also. And that's where we get into a lot of the problems. And so right. my Unitarian friends have been pointing this out for years. I think Trinitarians don't listen to them because they see so many deficiencies on the Unitarian side. I know my, my Unitarian friends don't like to hear that. Oneness, Aryan, Unitarian, they don't like to hear that. But I'm, I'm not going to sit here and try to argue against the sun not existing before the creation of the world. I mean, I have too many Dude. passages, right? I'm, yeah, you know, I yeah there's no argument. Unitarians are doing. Well, and like you said in your videos, the, the Trinity is implied. Mm. And... Like even with this book, Dr. Robert Morey, sure. he, he quotes the early, early church and all the passages of uh, Ignatius and all these mm -hmm, people. Mm -hmm. But everything they say is binatarian. And he says, well, look, they believe in the Trinity. But no, you see a duality of the Godhead in their writings. Amen. So they, Amen. it's implied, like you said. Amen. And Amen. You, you just can't find it. Uh, the Trinity, you just can't find it. Amen. Spot on. Spot on. And by the way, that's why that's why I started my channel. I wasn't hearing people saying this. Mm -hmm. And and by the way, I have I have Robert Morey's book. Uh, and like you, uh, I, I'm, I'm not I'm not convinced of it. Uh, nice. You know, an, an interesting guy. He does a lot of apologetic works. Um, I had his book before I became a bonitarian. Right. So you can imagine I've gone through his book a few times. And it's like you said, it's, it's a lot of implied stuff. And what yeah. they're really doing is they're using the father and son. And my joke is they're stealing our verses to try to prove their point. In other words, they're using threefold passages, you know, twofold passages as threefold proof. They're taking, you know, these bonitarian texts and then assuming it. 
if you ever, ever want to halt a Trinitarian and get them to think, and that's why I said the, the quickest way to, to disprove the Trinity is to prove it, is to say to, them, say to them, just say, hey, can you show me where the Father and the Son love, know, honor, are indwell, mutually indwell a third person? Give me any one of those four. Now, no one's going to say those four aren't important. But we can do it all day, Father. I mean, just think about it. Somebody tried to tell me that Jesus doesn't love the Father. I have verses. John chapter 14, you know, I got texts yeah. where he says it, right? I got the Father speak, you know, splits heaven open and says, this is my beloved son, right? I've often said, I, I have three daughters, three beautiful daughters who I love, very creative daughters. And I often said, if I had two of them, hoist one of them up in a chair like a bar mitzvah and just go around the room and just all day long just say, hey, while I say, this is my beloved daughter. And let's say all, and they do it obediently. They love, you know, they 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 love me, and they 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 follow my command just like she does. And I never once pause and say, by the way, I also these also are my beloved daughters. Now that wouldn't work in my house. I don't know about your house, people. But in my house, that's not gonna fly. No, um, no way. <laughs> I'll be some, first of all, my wife would put me in check. <laughs> but 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 they would rightfully so. And even others who would see that, if they heard me say that, they'd be like, well, when is he ever going to say something about? His other daughter. I mean, they're holding her up in the in the bar mitzvah chair, and you know, and they're you know they're celebrating, they're being obedient, and by his silence, his silence is deafening. You can't find a passage where the father and the son love the spirit, or vice versa. And I mean, yeah. and, and whenever I toss this out, the Trinitarians they start, you know, you could tell they're just they want the pride and the ego gets in, and they don't just pause. Hey, Mario, you're making a good point. Um, Jonathan Edwards, who lived hundreds of years ago. Uh, you know, in the Northeast, he actually wrote a book on it's an unpublished book on the Trinity, treatise on the Trinity. He tackles this topic head on because it bothered him. It bothered him. Uh, you can find it online for free the unpublished treatise on the Trinity by Jonathan Edwards. And he basically says, Hey guys, um, why does the Bible doesn't say the Father loves the Spirit and vice <laughs> versa? And and, and he and, and he's a, he's a very intellectual guy, considered one of the greatest American philosophers, right? And thinkers and theologians. So he comes up with his best attempt. By the way, which is still the answer that's used by theologians. By I shouldn't say all, but many theologians is well, the Holy Spirit is the love between the Father and the Son. And, and, and by the way, that's got problems. But my, my argument is that's a bonitarian statement. Right. When, when I talk about God loving me from his heart, he's loving me from his spirit. Right. Um, that's the only way he can love me. He, he loves me from. I always say God tells us to love us, love him with our heart, soul, mind and strength, because he loves us from his heart, from his soul, his spirit. Right. Mm -hmm. From his spirit. He loves us. And that's not a person. Right. Because that creates all kinds of problems. And then does the person love the to the father and the son? Does that create another person? It, it, it's not there. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and, and as great as Jonathan Edwards was, he could not solve the absence. And when I say it, it's not just an absence, it's a sinful absence. God will not dishonor himself, right? Remember, God says, I will honor all who honor me. The son served the father and the father exalted him to his right hand. By my count, the third person has been going strong for like over 2000, you know, 2000 plus years on the <laughs> earth glorifying Christ. He's, is he going to sit at the right hand of the son? I mean, I mean, if there's anybody who's worthy of that seat, it's him, right? You don't find any of that. All you get is excuses, not biblical explanations. And and those type of, and we could, by the way, we could do this all day long. Worship, yeah. honor, co-indwelling. And when we put that across all the Bible, we do the comparison of what we do see for the father and the son, right? To him who sits on the throne and unto the lamb, be glory and honor and blessing and power and might. We we, we, we we don't have the same problem. These are the Bible clearly has language to communicate this and it doesn't. And it tells us something else. And that made me. And that's why I study, because I now have confidence that it's not me. I didn't come up with this. This is what was taught to me from the word. Right. And I mean, it's so clear, like I quoted to, I quoted Matthew eleven twenty seven. Mm -hmm. even in the Gospel of John, I call it the Shema of the New Testament where Jesus mm. plainly says, I and my father are one. That is a binatarian statement <laughs> straight from the Messiah's mouth. I mean, you, there's no arguing it. So, hey, I mean, man, you, you, you preach to the choir here, man. I, I, I'm enjoying <laughs> this conversation, Peter. This is, this is better than my Trinitarian debates. <laughs> well, what, what I, I, actually, I have a statement that I've made, um, you know, and I said this years ago when I was floored by John, John is the most binatarian book ever written on the absolutely. planet. Absolutely. Um, I say 
show me a chapter in John that's not binatarian. You go to John chapter five. My goodness, I love one of, it's one of my new favorite chapters in the in, in the Bible, John five. And you hear the Lord Jesus Christ being challenged because he said he was the son of God and he's going at them. He's talking about I am my father. You know, all will honor me honor the son, even as they honor the father. And you you hear very, he's going to judge the world. The father judges no one but's committed. all. I mean, you're like Commit all judgment to the son. Yeah. Oh, and, and Peter, let, let me just say this, because it wouldn't be me if I didn't use this word relationship. Mm -hmm. relationship. When God tells us to do anything, he doesn't just come to us and say, hey, do this, don't do this. It's always, I am the Lord, your God. You have a relationship with me. You are my people. I am your God. I am your father. You are my child. Now, what people never re realize is we see very clearly father and son, that's clear relationship, right? The, as the father, so the son, right? And I believe they've always been together. But here's a question. Once again, I, I have lots of these. Here's one. For there to be a relationship, there has to be some type of role. And all you have to ask is, what is the family relationship for the third person? Now, here's a stunner. You and I, we're children of God. If you ask me, am I in God's family? My answer is yes. Right? I'm in God's family. I'm in the household of faith. I am a child of God. Thank God. Thank God. I'm more surprised than everyone else. But What's higher than a child? I mean, there's the father and then there's the child, but what's higher? And obviously there's no mother. We don't, we don't, we're not, we're not, we're not Mormons, right? Um, but what's higher than that? You got the father and the son. Now you got to ask, what relationship is the Holy Spirit to the father? What relationship is the, the Holy Spirit to the son? They're not brothers because then you'd have two sons, right? Um, they're, they're, they're Greek and Hebrew words to communicate this, right? Um, there's a Hebrew word. I mean, there's a Greek word that communicates kinship and relation, and it's used throughout the New Testament. It's even used in the, in the Septuagint of the Old Testament for relative. They could have used that one, a generic relative. It's not there. It's not there. So when I ask Trinitarians, I say, wait a minute. So I'm a child. I'm in the household of God. I'm a, I'm a family member. I, I'm an heir, right? I'm a co-heir with Christ. I mean, like I said, you know, if I did, if I had hair, I'd pull it out. I mean, that that's just bonkers. Where's the Holy Spirit at in the family of God? What's his relation? Is he a member of the family? Is he a son? Is he a child? Is he an heir? What is he? Mm -hmm. They have zero answer because he's not a third person, right? The spirit is God's own spirit. And that's why it's missing there. That, you got to imagine that, that that would be an incomplete, a lopsided relationship. And we wouldn't have a way of communicating. Like we can talk to Jesus and say, he's our elder brother. We're co-heirs with Christ. God is our father. The Holy Spirit is our... There's no relationship. Not an uncle. I mean, what is he? You know? Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I like how you put it um, in one of your videos where you say that God confers his spirit mm. to us. It's it's part of his being. It's what God is composed of. And he gives mm. us part of him to us. Amen. As it says in Romans, the eighth chapter, his spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And this is how we are children of Amen. God by the Holy Spirit that he gives to us. He gives us part of himself to Amen. us. That's that's fantastic. I like it, it, feels, it feels good that we can, we have verses all day. Now, Peter, I'm told that Romans 8 was a Trinitarian chapter. They always told me that <laughs> chapter proved that Paul believed in the Trinity. By the way, when you ask Trinitarians, give me the verses where Paul teaches the Trinity. They're going to give you Romans 8, and then they give you 2 Corinthians uh, 13, right? The, uh, the uh -huh. benediction. Um, and Romans 8, I always laugh when they give me Romans 8. I was like, you went to the wrong chapter to prove that, especially jumping in at verse 20, uh, 25 and 26 and skipping the other 25 verses where Paul can go from spirit of God, spirit of Christ, Christ in us, um, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead. And like you said, he sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts to bear witness that we are children of God. How can the spirit as a third person teach me to cry Abba Father when he's never called him that? But the son can, the spirit of Christ can, Christ can. And it, it even says it, like Paul says, Christ in me, the hope of glory. Like he already says in Galatians 2.20, one of my favorite verses, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And, and, and I believe, uh, you know, in, in multiple places, Jesus said explicitly, I will be in you and the father will be in you. We will make our home with you. And that's done through the spirit. First John 3.24, 4.13. He dwells in us by the spirit, which he has given us. Part Amen. of God is in the Christian, part of the father and the son. The, the spirit is poured out mm. to us. 
So, I mean, it's, it's clear what the Holy Spirit is. And Amen. it's interesting you quoted that uh, scholar. Here's an Anglican scholar who says this. Uh, where is he here? Rawlinson, he's an Anglican scholar. He says this, The belief in two divine beings was widely, widely held among Christians in the early New Testament times. As one authority states, the whole history of, the early, of early Christianity gives us abundant examples of mm. binatarian thought. That's an Anglican scholar who's a Trinitarian. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So Amen. they they see that uh, there is binatarianism in the New Testament. They they admit it. Let me let me go let me go one step further, Peter. By the way, I love your quotes, man. I'm, I'm really enjoying this conversation. Um, and by the way, we have more. We have more. We have yeah, more. There's plenty. Um, there's plenty. Yeah. Here, here here's one. So New Testament. And by the way, we 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 like I said, please turn to a page in the New Testament. And I, I jokingly say every other page, but I could probably say every page of the New Testament. You're seeing God and Christ, Father and Son working together, right? And I'm not just talking about references, I'm talking about relationship. But here's something. There are now Jews, Jewish scholars, who argue that even prior to the time of Christ and during the time of Christ, that there were Jews who found it acceptable to believe that there were two powers in heaven. And you have people like the late, great Alan uh, Segal, um, you have uh, also now the late, great, um, you know, uh, Larry Hurtado, uh, my favorite Trinitarian scholar, Larry Hurtado. He wrote a book, One God and One Lord. It is the most bonitarian book written by a Trinitarian, right? Mm -hmm. he, he's a Trinitarian because he says, hey, I, you know, my job is church history and going to the New Testament text and the New Testament history. But he said he says it very clearly. He's like the shape of worship in the New Testament was bonitarian. And, and he said, well, why didn't you say Trinitarian? He was like, because it wasn't. It was it was bonitarian. He says, yeah, you got three, four references places, but it's clear it's God and Christ. And he goes through many passages, but he also goes through the Jewish history and said this was common for the Jews, the, the, the Aramaic speaking Jews and the Targums and in other places. You see them referencing, you know, uh, you know, like the son of man passages are you know, are obviously clearly the messianic passage of Psalm 110. So what he argues and Daniel Boyarin, who, who actually is a practicing Jew, right? Um, he, he argues that, no, these are Bonitarians, and they go to the New Testament, like Daniel Boyarin says, John is a Bonitarian, just like the other Bonitarians who lived before him uh, or lived during his time frame. Right. And so what's amazing is because Trinitarians very often like to say, hey, well, the Trinity's been around the longest. Therefore, you, you, know, you know, the church has been Trinitarian for so long, it's got to be true. My argument is you don't want to do that argument if you're a Trinitarian, because we have the ultimate trump card, right? Meaning, here's the ace that we can lay down every time. Before the New Testament came, there were Jews who believed in two powers. There were Jews who said there's there's, there's two, right? And, and, and there's God and there's someone who's coming in the name of God and operating and God is sending. And, and they, they, they were okay with that combination as monotheists. And we have scholars now. And by the way, the Trinitarians, they quote these scholars because they do want to defend the deity of Christ. But when yeah. they quote Boyarin and they quote Alan Seagal, and they quote Larry Hurtado, they don't go on and say, well, wait a minute, why can't we say this for the Trinity? Because they know they can't. And so my argument is, if you want to go based off history, even Jewish scholars today and Trinitarian scholars acknowledge the Bonitarian roots of the New Testament. So I'll take Bonitarian roots of the New Testament rooted in the Old Testament over the tradition of the church any day of the week. Yeah, it's interesting you said that about the Jews, that they weren't strict monotheists. Some were binatarian. And you uh, you quote from uh, Daniel Bo Boyarin. Yeah, Boyarin. That, yes, uh, he wrote an article called The Gospel of the Memra, Jew mm. Jewish Binatarianism, Prologue to John. Awesome. And great, where, great one. Yeah, uh, John 1.1, 1, 1, which we're going to get into now. Sure, where it sure. Says, In the By the way, Unitarians the are allergic to reading that article. I've tried to get Unitarians to read that article. Yeah. They will not read it. They're allergic to it because it undermines one of their claims that Jews were this strict monotheist who didn't have this concept of, you know, two powers or whatever, you know, however you want to frame it. Well, I have the article here. Awesome. On my computer. What I'm going to do is after this live stream, I'm going to upload it. And I'll put the oh. link in the video description if anybody wants to uh, download it uh, for themselves, read it for themselves. But uh, what's interesting, if we go to John 1.1, 1, 1, and it says, In the beginning was the Word, and that Word is uh, Logos in the Greek. But John, 
of course, was Jewish, Aramaic. And for him, that word meant memory, which is the word that uh, Daniel Boyarin is talking about. And that meant a second divine being, didn't it, for some, for some Jews? Well, let's, let's, let's go through it. What, what I would say, what I think... I think part of the ambiguity, and I always say I want to I want to make sure I thread the needle carefully, right? Um, I have my speculations, but what I'll say is you have some Jews who will say second divine being. I, I'll use I'll use Philo as a great example. Everybody knows Philo, and Philo also used the term logos, right? I think John obviously has a more uh, a stronger use of it that's rooted in Christ, right? He's rooted in Christ, right. but Philo would have no problem talking about the logos as the second God, and you even have other you know uh, post apostolic um, theologians like Origen, they'll talk about a second theos or something like that. What I find is there are some who are comfortable with that language and some who are not, right? So, so what I see is that the, for example, I'll use Memra. I think Memra was their attempt to say, hey, we see something very clearly here, that God is transcendent and yet he's imminent at the same time. And there, there are many paths, and we're talking here about the, the Torah, right? We're talking about the, the, the prophets and the, and the writings, right? We're going right there. God shows up, and yet they know that no one can see God and live, right? And, and the New Testament comes right behind us and says, no one has seen God at any time, right? And yet they see God all over the place, right? Um, yep. Abraham Isaiah saw him. God. <laughs> Isaiah, yeah. I, I love the Isaiah path. It's clear. I saw the Lord, right? Well, yeah, he says, I have seen the king, Yahweh of hosts. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's clear saw. as day. So, so they struggled and they were like, how do you, and in addition to his works of creation and other things. So when you go back and read the Targums, remember the Targums are Jewish, you know, I would say Jewish commentary. It, I want to use the word commentary in the loose. It's not like Talmudic commentary or, 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 or the Midrash. It's, it's, but it's them putting the Torah, or I would say the Tanakh, in their Aramaic language. And in the process, they'll add some additional things. And you can tell from their use of words like Mimra, which you mentioned, which is word, they'll use that to carry out actions. For example, when it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. Well, it was the Mimra who did that. Mm -hmm. And they'll distinguish the Mimra from, you know, from the true and the living God or from God himself. And, and then Adam and Eve, right? You know, and they said that God was walking with them in the cool of the day. Well, it was the Mimra who did that. And yeah. in fact, as you go through, you see that. And it's, it's so consistent. Once again, it's so consistent. It is, it's intentional. What they're basically saying, and, and, and you have a spectrum. Some say that's, that's God imminent, God, you know, God you know, manifesting himself in the creation or being active in the creation. I know some oneness people who are, who are starting to come around to the concept of a memory, and they're saying, well, that's, that's just really just God preeminent or God imminent in his creation. The only problem is when you keep going through the, the Old Testament itself, even apart from the Targums, the Old Testament itself gives you those two features, those two figures. So Alan Segal can say the Jews did not know what to do with Daniel uh, chapter seven, where you have the son of man passage and he's seated, you know, it's like, you know, he, he comes on the cloud, he's ushered into the, the, the presence of the ancient of days and all people's language, num, you know, names and, you know, uh, nations and tribes should serve him. And he's given a kingdom that will not end. And the Jews said this, and there was a whole controversy there because it was, it was uncomfortable, like, well, we thought only one should be like that, but it's, well, there's a second figure here. Isn't that they're 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 uncomfortable? It's it's simply because of their biases. Well, <laughs> right. That's always just the because case. they're That's uncomfortable. Always. I mean, doesn't mean they're right. <laughs> I mean, but Psalm one ten, Psalm one ten is clear as day. The Lord yeah. said to my Lord, "Sit at my." right hand right and, and, and that's clear, be my right? he's exalted yeah. at the right hand of god not at the he didn't say the lord said to my lord sit at my right hand which would have had him just as an earthly you know ruler no the god says sit at my right hand and so you have two and and and, and alan seagal who, who passed away he said the, the 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 rabbis especially after christianity was spreading they had to sit down and say what are we going to do about this because we have these kind of passages and there was, there's clearly rabbis who believed in two powers. We have to declare this to be a heresy. And that's really what Alan Segal's book is. Is like, when did this become a heresy? Because as a Jew, he didn't believe that this was even possible. But when he went back and looked at the literature, it's like, no, these are, these are Jews like me. And they clearly, prior to the time of Christ, found this as being acceptable within orthodoxy. It was only after you get to like the, the, the destruction of the temple and you get Christianity spreading, and Jews were really kind of like reconsidering their identity and say, how do we, 
how do we how we reestablish our identity as Jews? Obviously, they wanted to go strict monotheism. So they went much more stricter than what the, the Jews were in the times of Christ. And then as a part of that, they basically said, we're going to denounce the two powers as heresy. And from that point on, the two, the two, the two split and never shall the two meet, you know, unless they, they right. repent. Yeah, they went more strictly monotheist later in their correct, history, correct. as opposed to way back uh, before the time of Christ. I mean, there there is literature that does show that, the two divine beings. But By the um, way, that, that surprised me. I didn't know that until after becoming a Bonitarian and then going yeah. back and studying it. And I, I was blown. I was like, yeah. why is no one talking about this? I'm, like, I'm not talking yeah. about it regularly. Like uh, when I wrote my book, Who, What is God? And I went through all the research. And uh, let me just put it in the chat room here. If people want to download it. Oh, nice. Sorry, I clicked the wrong button. Okay. Um, let me just put it up there if people want to download it. And I got your links in the video description oh, uh, too, oh, Mario. Thank you, so. thank, you. thank you. I much appreciate it, Peter. And when when I did the research, I couldn't believe it either. I, I, I started researching. I saw, look at this. Some of the Jews believed in a duality. Yes. At least of of a godhead, of a, another divine being, the memory, the spokesman. And let's get into that passage. Sure, let's talk. Why, why do Jehovah's Witnesses mm. have a problem with this passage that says, In the beginning was the word, memory. Sure. And the word was with God, and the word was God. Sure. Why is that a problem for so many people? <laughs> ah, man, we, we, we'll be here all day. Um, <laughs> by the way, I, I, I would argue that um, for Jehovah's Witness, there's something else that's at, at play as well. Um, you know, I have uh, friends and family members who are who are Jehovah's Witness, and I think there's something else that's at play where when there's somebody telling you what the word has to mean uh, and you can't see it for yourself. So if any of them are, are watching, I would definitely tell you, like, I know what it feels like to have someone tell you what the word says and then God opens your eyes and you never want to go back. Um, but I, I'll tell you this. So they, they basically believe, and here's, a, here's the argument. They come to the text. You said it earlier, biases, assumptions, presuppositions. They basically are so used to arguing against Trinitarians that they say, hey, first of all, they believe Jesus is created, right? They believe he's, you know, he was an angel. Yeah. He was created. Let's just say, they believe he was Michael the Archangel, which we'd have to do like two podcasts to do that one, uh, right? <laughs> um, yeah. but, 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 but the problem is they come with the presupposition that, there can only be one who's fully divine. There cannot be a son who also is fully divine. Once you challenge that, and by the way, let me show you how you challenge that. First of all, they come there, and when you look at the Greek text, there's three possibilities. And I, I'll say three here to kind of narrow it down. Uh, and here, by the way, I'm quoting the work of uh, my favorite Trinitarian Greek grammarian, Daniel Wallace, right? Uh, if her title is my favorite uh, uh, theologian, then uh, Daniel Wallace is my favorite Trinitarian grammarian. He has a whole section in his grammar on this. But he says, when you look at how the Greek is structured, right? Yeah. First of all, and, and by the way, I, I, I say this in my book all over the place. They assume that there's you're either the definitive God or you're indefinite God, right? Definitive God, the God, the God, the Father, right? Or they'll mm -hmm. say indefinite, a God, right? In, in English, we have the and we have a. The is the definite article. A is the indefinite article. In Greek, there's no indefinite article, right? Not that you need one, right? But what they assume is, well, it says there, and the word was theos, and actually it says theos was the, you know, the word was, right? If you want to actually use word order. But they're correct that it does begin before and after by using the God for the Father. In the beginning was the word, right? Uh, and the word was with God, ha Theos. He was pros ton theon, right? Pros ton theon, right? That's the definite article God. And that's clearly the Father. And all throughout the New Testament mm -hmm. and the Old Testament, that def definite article is usually how they'll distinguish the Father, right? You, you, in, in fact, I wish everyone had glasses that you could put on and just see the definite articles on the Greek text. It would blow you away how often yeah. it's used. Hebrew, Hebrew and Greek, by the way, does this, right? Even in Hebrew, Definite article. I'm not saying it's used 99% of the time, but I'm saying, you know, well, close to it, maybe 95% of the time. But I'm saying that most often the predominant way of referring to the Father is the God. So in my book, I just coined the phrase the definitive God, right? The most high God. And so John sandwiches the statement about Christ by two statements about Jesus being with 
the Father or the God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with the God. And he says, and the Word was God. And then he says again, he was in the beginning with the God, right? So we know who he's talking about, who he was with. He was with the Father. In the middle, John also wants to say, but the Word was God. He wasn't saying a God, and he wasn't saying the God. There's a third option, and everybody misses this. There's, you can say the word is the definitive God, indefinite, but there's also what's known as qualitative. Qualitative means God is what he was. A lot of people forget that God is also used objectively, and especially in John, John uses this throughout, right? I'll give some examples that you, you know right out of the gate. God is love, not the love, not a love. No, no, God is love. God is light. God is spirit, right? He's not, the, he's not, he's not a spirit, right? He's spirit. He's talking about him yeah. being spirit and in, in who he is. But here's one. In John 14, it says, I'm sorry, John chapter 1, verse 14, and the word became flesh, exactly parallel with what the word was God and the word became flesh. You see the verbs and you see how it's used also with the association that he's doing with the flesh. But flesh is not the flesh. It's not a flesh. It's simply flesh as a category, right? Like when I, when I look at a passage like Isaiah 31 uh, verses one through three, where, where God can talk about himself and say, hey, you have trusted in the Egyptians, but the Egyptians, you know, are, 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 are you know, are, are men, not God. Their horses, you know, they're, they're you know, their their uh, horses are flesh, not spirit, right? Now, when he uses spirit and God there, he's contrasting that with man and flesh, meaning what we are, right? And, and by the way, it uses exactly how John uses it in John one. That's in uh, Isaiah thirty one, verse one to three. In verse three, he uses that word God and spirit qualitatively, just like he could say spirit and flesh, right? And so the word was God. That's what he was. He became flesh. And so just like we wouldn't say a flesh or the flesh, we know flesh is a category. More sophisticated Jehovah Witnesses now know that that's an argument. And when, they're, and when in doubt, all you got to do is point them to a book like this where he shows how John especially uses that qualitative language throughout. God is light. God is love. God is spirit. Same about Christ, right? The word was spirit, was God. The word became flesh. Now, I will argue, I believe that Jesus, when he became flesh, he took on what we were, right? He took on, yeah. you know, like existing in the form of God, he humbled himself and he took on our nature. So as the, as, as the classic preacher said, subtraction by addition, right? He humbled himself. He didn't lose what he was, but he took on what we are to save us. Uh, I do agree with the the, 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 the ancient Trinitarians who will say anything that Christ did not assume unto himself is not redeemed by his redemption. In other words, he, he had to become what we were to save all that we are. And so I believe when Christ was a man, he was a man, but he was obviously, you know, the son of God. And that's why you find even the demons uh, trembling before him. He wasn't just a human like us. Right. Well, it also says in verse 14 that he is the monogenes, the only mm -hmm. begotten of the father. And in the Greek, that means the only race, stock, kind, family oh of the father so he's the same Amen. family of the father he was with the god meaning the sovereign the head mm. and he was also god the same kind as the father the same family amen, amen. and amen. i mean i don't know how they can argue when it says all things verse three were made by him without mm. him was not anything made that was made in him was light and so yeah. on and it plainly says in the book of isaiah that Yahweh created all things with his hands, his own hands, mm. and so yes. on. And here it's talking that yes. the word did all these things. And, you know, like Amen. we said before, no man has seen God at any time. So who is Isaiah speaking of? But the second member of the divine family. A, a Jehovah's Witness would agree easy. with that. A Jehovah's Witness will agree that God created all things through him, but they won't say what you just said before, which John said in verse 3. By the way, John 1, 3 especially in the Greek text, is a problem, is a problem, because John's even more intense. He says, through him, and obviously Jesus, he's, he's, he's focusing on Jesus' agency, same as we see in, you know, Corinthians, Colossians, Hebrews, uh, you know, yeah. all throughout the Bible, right, the agency of Christ. All things are created through him, and then John says this, this is literal rendering, 
And without him, not one thing. And the word one is in the text. It's the number one. Not one thing was created that has been created. Now, let me use the word created there. It's the word genomai in the Greek. This genomai. is the most foundational way of saying something being brought into existence, right? Um, being, being, you know, something that has come about, right? Like, like, like Jesus can say, before Abraham was, I am. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting, that word for was is different than what's used for Christ in, in, uh, in, uh, in John chapter one. The word for was for Abraham is the word genomai. Before Abraham genomai came to be, I am, right? And so, so when you read Christ, especially in 1, 3 there, and there's other passages I would use to make this point, but when John said, he, he says it positively, then he says it negatively. Through him, all things were made that have been made. If it falls under the category of it being genomai, right? And that's the word, right? Like when God says in Genesis, let there be and there was, there and there was, or you know, is the genomai, you know, and there was, it came to be. That's genomai is translated that way in the Septuagint. But John says there's nothing that came to be that didn't come to be through him and without him, meaning not apart from him, but only through him came to be not one thing that ever came to be. And that word one is in the text, not one. And my joke is what they're saying is there is one. And I'm saying, yeah. John's saying there's not one, right? Yeah, so either yeah. there is one or there's not one. I'm going to go with John. And let me just add to that. Jesus said before Abraham was, I am, which is ego emi in the Greek, used in the Septuagint for Exodus, the third chapter. Amen. And that's Yahweh God, the second divine member of the God family. He's called the angel of the Lord or the messenger of the Lord. And that's the spokesman, John 1, 1, the Amen. word. So it's all, it all fits together. And there's just no confusion whatsoever. But what about the Hebrews? Need, like, need a lot more angels. <laughs> <laughs> the Old Testament, they need a lot more angels. <laughs> uh, what about Hebrews one one? I mean, or well, Hebrews the first chapter where it says, "Let all the angels of God worship Him." Mm. I mean, the Jehovah Witnesses they have a problem with this chapter. You see Jesus being worshipped. You see the oh. Father calling the Son God because they're the mm. same kind. It says, thou, Lord, in the beginning you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands, and so on, mm. calling Jesus the creator. I mean, Amen. how did Jehovah Amen. Witnesses get around this one? <laughs> they, by the way, they, they, they struggle with Hebrews um, chapter 1, um, that, those, those last few verses there, especially verse 8. Um, they try to make it say, your throne, where it says, your throne, O God. They want to say, God is your throne. And they're basically uh -huh. trying to play upon a possibility in the Greek. There's a great art. Actually, in my book, I actually quote an article uh, from that text uh, where a guy actually goes and shows when you go through the Psalms, that is not how he does it. The way he would he would have said it much differently than that if he was trying to say, God is your throne. It's your throne, O oh God. It's a vocative address. He's the father is addressing the son as your O oh God, right? Which by the way, that that's you know, that's from the old testament. He had, he has no problem saying, you know, you know. Now he doesn't call him my God. He says, Oh God, right? Oh God. Um, and because the father never refers to the son as my God and my Lord, that's not true. Like right? I always say, the most high doesn't have a head. Um, you know, but the son but Jesus does. does. Jesus, Jesus does. does because he's the mm. father. He honors Correct. the father. It's just like with me and my father. I mm. mean, we're both human, but he's the head, the Amen. sovereign of the Amen. family, right? Amen. And he's Amen. my uh, so, but what about uh and it's, it's so interesting that illustrations you can use, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Family it's interesting that the father, but here's the kicker. The father mm -hmm. calls the son God. And he says, oh thou mm -hmm. Lord, which is curious. Correct. In the beginning laid the foundations of the earth and so on. I mean, this is the father saying this to the son. I, I believe in that chapter. And by the way, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to actually restrict myself because we go to Hebrews chapter one. We, we, we can yeah. be here all, all night long. Yeah, um, uh, I know. There's so much depth in the scriptures. It's amazing. I love he, I love Hebrews. And, he, and I always say the Bonitarians, our two favorite books are Gospel of John and Hebrews. Um, they, they're just, you know, you, we can just go there all day. But what I will say is this, is he clearly is showing that there's angels that are here and the sun is up here, right? Mm -hmm. um, the sun is the, is, the, is the outshining of the, the glory of God. 
and he is the the exact representation of his being. And to which of the sons has he to the angels did he ever say? And so the writer of Hebrews is ending with a crescendo, quoting a litany of seven passages from the Old Testament to say it's the Father who's exalting the Son, right? And I always tell people people miss that point. I'm a Bonitarian because God said so, right? When I come to God and I say, God, I love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. What do you want me to do? He says, listen to my beloved son, hear him, obey him, honor him. And so he commanded all the angels to worship him. And that's why Jesus said, whoever doesn't honor the son does not honor the father. You have to go through Christ, right? You can't you can't sidestep Jesus and get to God. That's that's not how it works. You got to go through Christ. And and God says so. God says, if you want to honor me, right, you want to be a faithful a believer in God, honor my son. That's the one through whom I did all of these things. His hands laid the foundation of the world. The heavens are the work of his hands. They will roll up. They're creation. They're going to roll up, but he will remain. His years have no end. He is the same. And as he says later in the book, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so, so we do worship him and we honor him even as we honor the father. And like Christ said uh, to Thomas, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. Amen. And that, that co corresponds with Hebrews 1, uh, 3, where it says that he is the expressed image of his person. He's mm. the exact copy, representative of the Father. So if you've seen mm -hmm. him, you've seen the Father. He I is mean, the image of and God. doesn't Hebrews 1 put to rest the whole argument that Jesus was an angel? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's you clear know here. He <laughs> says, let all the angels of God worship him. So clearly, Jesus is not an angel. I'm just gonna say amen. I think me, me and you, you and I, we can, we can, <laughs> we can, we can, we 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 can we can do this all day long. Um, I don't know, I don't know, Peter, why um, uh, a Jehovah Witness or anyone for that matter would look at Jesus. Uh, I know some non-Jehovah Witness who try to make this claim and look at Jesus and say he's Michael the Archangel. Um, you got so many paths. He made all things visible and invisible. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. You got that in Colossians as well as in Hebrews, where it says he upholds the world by the word of his power. Mm -hmm. um, Michael, uh, at the, in, in the book of Jude, Michael couldn't rebuke the devil. He had to say, the Lord rebuke you. Uh, Jesus never had to uh, had to do that. Um, you know, uh, oh, yeah. and, so, exactly. um, and you go to passages like in Revelation where you actually see, it talk about the son being born of the woman and you see Michael and they're, they're clearly different. They're not the same. Jesus is not Michael. He created Michael and Michael and, and all every knee will bow. That includes Michael and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Because it says all things in heaven and on earth. Exactly, exactly. Um, do you think, when it comes to the origin of the Trinity doctrine, do mm. you think that any, uh, was there any pagan influence at the time Greek? Mm. There was a lot of Greek philosophical speculations. They try to use Greek philosophy to explain God. I mean, that was the thought of the day during the time of the Council on Nicaea. Do you, do you believe some of the origins of the Trinity come from that? Hmm. That's a great question, Peter. This is a good one. This is what I'm going to do. I, I, uh, I've often said um, church history is like a mistress who doesn't tell many secrets, right? She, she keeps a lot of secrets. Um, so I'm always hesitant because I wasn't there and I don't have, there, there's no church history, you know, that's written outside the book of Acts that's, you know, God breathed, you know, that's, you know, that's God inspired. And so I'm always subject, even by the people that were there. Um, so what I'll say is this, there definitely was some influence. Now, we're talking about people. I don't want to talk in generalities. I want to talk about people. Influence varies from person to person, right? And my argument is this, is these guys were not ironclad, you know, exegetes who knew Hebrew and Greek and studied the word and just, and I'm not saying that I, that's me either, right? But I'm just saying, we have the, the perspective of building off what the church has you know, argued for centuries. And so we can look and say, all right, let's get into this word. Let's go find what other researchers have found. I think they were still struggling to figure out what they were going to do with the Holy Spirit. And there was no compelling alternative present. Right. When you look at the Bonitarians that were around then, I jokingly say it and say they were the JV squad. They, they weren't they weren't they weren't they weren't they weren't the, the rigorous ones like like Peter and Mario here, where we're quoting all these verses and bring up all these points. <laughs> there, there were some. But, but my point was that when you look at the influences, I think it came in gradually through the need to try to justify their beliefs before a Greek speaking world. And you find people like Origen who popularized this. Origen, you know, 
by the way, I'll, I'll put a note on Origin. Origin wrote a, 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 a tract against Celsus, which in my opinion is one of the best Bonitarian tracts you can find. You go read it. You, if you go find that against Celsus by Origin, you, you'll read it and say, this, this sounds like what I believe, right? Right, um, right. And, I mean, he's, he's right down the line. But he did over time, you see Origin, he wrote so much and he did so much. He did not hesitate to do speculation. And at times he would he would speculate about things that were beyond scripture. And this is what I'll say to us today. The lesson that I learned is you have to really speak stick strict to the word, stick to the word. You got to make sure you don't you don't you don't you don't start adopting language and logic just for illustration purposes. And I think a lot of the early apologists, I'll even use I, I, I throw my friend Justin Martin under the bus a little bit. Right. He was a philosopher. Right. He was a philosopher. But there, there are certain parts of the Bible we don't think that Justin Martin had. Uh, certain parts of the of the New Testament he don't he didn't necessarily he doesn't show familiarity with, and there's other writers you see they're not doing deep study. Uh, so my thought is I think it's a combination of three things. One, I don't think they were as strong in their biblical exegesis, especially the Old Testament, the law, the prophets, and the writers. They were not they were not as strong in that. Aside from a few stories in Genesis, a few quote. No, I mean like following the flow, and the same in the New Testament. And you see that in Tertullian. He, he, he's, he's writing like a lawyer. He's not, he's not, I mean, he's quoting in proof text, but he's doing it like a lawyer. He's not sitting there saying, let me understand Deuteronomy. Let me understand Isaiah. Let me understand John and Matthew. Um, and then what you have is they were willing, especially through origin, after origin, the door was wide open. They use a lot of speculation and allegory. They use a lot of, you know, um, speculative thought. And, and, they, and, and they, they weren't really confined to the language of scripture. And then I'll say thirdly, I don't think there was a suitable alternative there that was rigorous. There were people who were Bonitarians, right? Whoever wrote the Shepherd of Hermas was Bonitarian. I believe personally that uh, Clement of Rome was Bonitarian, Polycarp, and we can go Melito of Sardis, right? I, I'm, I would gladly quote Melito of Sardis as being Bonitarian. But they, when it came down time for the fourth century in those councils, especially the Council of Constantinople, right? If you if you really look at it, Nicaea 325, they just said, we believe in the Holy Spirit. And they were like, uh, let's skip that one for now, right? <laughs> 381, after the influence of the Cappadocians like Basil, uh, Gregory of Nazianzus and Gregory of Nyssa, very influential guys. Exegesis as weak as water, weak exegesis, really? the weakest. If you go read Basil on the Holy Spirit, I've read that book multiple times and I get mad reading it. The exegesis is so poor. It's just proof texting. And that's what they based it on. He used political influence to get that over the top, even even sanctioning certain language to be used. That was contrary to the biblical language. We have letters of his where he says, hey, I know the Bible uses this word this way. We got to start using it this way. And we have the letters. By the way, this is no secret. There's no conspiracy theory. We, we actually have it. You can go on CCEL, uh, Cl Christian Classic Ethereal Library, and, and read his letter where he says, stop using this word this way. He's writing to bishops. He says, stop using this word. I know the Bible uses it that way. We're going to start using the word person to mean this. And you got to go with the flow because we want to avoid oneness, you know, our, our um, yeah. Sibelianism. And so yeah. all that- They're converged. held in high regard. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, they put it over the top. And and no one, no one was there really to challenge them. But I'll say this, Peter, because sometimes we say, well, man, you know, what do we do now? I've often said truth ultimately outshines tradition. Tradition has its longevity, but Jesus was no fan of tradition. You know, he says, you guys have a fine way of, 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 of nullifying the word of God in order to hold to the commandments of men. And my argument is, Christ didn't give us, you know, he didn't give us a opportunity just to say, hey, you know what? The tradition's here. Don't challenge it. No, no, no. Christ says, no, I got to stand with the, you know, I had the traditionalists that were challenging him. He says, I'm going to, I'm going to challenge you. We got to do the same. We're going to be with like Christ. We got to defend the word of God. And by the way, yeah. it's not a fun job. It's not a fun job. That's why Jews said contend for the faith that was once for yeah. all delivered to the saints, not comply with the tradition that was later settled by the, the, the church. Contend for that faith. And by faith, he's talking about the scriptures because he continually in that 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 small letter keeps quoting the apostles. Um, and so my argument is we got to do the same. And yeah. in the 20 years that I've been a Bonitarian, this has made my relationship with God and Christ stronger, has made my knowledge of the word stronger. I got a lot to learn. But, um, you know, and it's also given me conviction to say, you know what, 
we can't repeat what they did. We have to really be meticulous. Like I said, it's like threading a needle, but we got to stick to the biblical language and logic and um, and, and, and hold our ground. Uh, you know, generation, I believe there's, you know, there may be generations later that'll come and say, hey, you know what? Uh, you know, I don't know how much time we got left here, but, you know, there may be some younger people who are, and by the way, I, I see younger people email me all the time saying like, hey, I knew something was wrong. I just needed to hear somebody say it. Um, right. And like we're doing tonight, we're saying it clearly. And I can tell you and I, we can, we can, we can take the Trinity apart all night long, but we can also demonstrate what the Bible positively says. Right. Well, I, but it's interesting that all these uh, people that you mentioned in church history, I mean, yet they're all held in high regard by a lot of these uh, scholars and, and Trinitarians. But I want to quote you this from uh, oh, Donna Broadhurst. Don't she know says it. this, uh, Gentile Christians usually came from a background devoid of scriptural knowledge. They did not have a natural appreciation for mm -hmm. allegiance to or comprehension of the scriptures, especially the law or the prophets, which they misunderstood, overlooked, or actually discarded in the early church. So same thing that you were saying. And she says the problem with Gentile Christians was not only their lack of familiarity with the scriptures, but also their excessive fascination with Greek philosophical speculations, which conditioned their understanding of biblical truths. Right. So so it's it's true what you're saying that that I think Greek philosophy had a hand in trying to explain what God is. Yeah, I, they're, they're definitely, like I said, each person, like I look at Justin Martyr quite a bit, you know, uh, Tertullian yeah. quite a bit, yeah. right? So he says, what, what, what does uh, Jerusalem have to do with Athens? And I was like, well, I want, I want to ask him the same question when I, you know, <laughs> if I see him. But, but my, 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 my part is this. We see the same thing happen today, Peter. Um, it takes courage to go against, you know, kind of like the flow uh, of people, especially when it comes to religious things. And what happens very often, it becomes very easy just to, to not analyze, to not scrutinize, and just to say, hey, I'll believe whatever has been told to me. Most people, I want you to think about this. Most people who are Christians are exactly in the same beliefs that they started out in. Now, I'm not saying that's necessarily bad, but I'm just saying you and I kind of both would survey a lot of that and say, well, some of that's not solid, right? But you don't find people necessarily moving or growing up beyond that. They're kind of remaining in that. And what happens is, I often say tradition is when you take somebody else's beliefs and make an idol out of it. You take their beliefs and then make an idol for you. And as opposed to Christ says, come to me, come, you know, you know, open the scripture study. I've often told people this because on my channel, you know, I get I get I get eaten up in the comments a lot. I, I'm used to it. Though. I got thick skin. But they'll say something like this, like, oh, you're a heretic. Are you you're you're you know, you're going against the tradition of the church. Right. Um, and I have Protestants say this, by the way. And I say to them, I say, well, wait a minute. When it comes to tradition, I don't see if you if you told me that the Bible says each of us will give an account of himself to the church council or the <laughs> church tribunal, then I'm all ears. But my Bible, the last time I looked, it says each one of us. That's me. That's me. Will give account of himself to Christ. Christ. He you alone. I mean, you're not going to have any help. It's you one on one. <laughs> I, I, and, and by the way, they can't help me then. They can't help no. me. I can't say he's going to say, Mario, why? And, and by the way, he said, and Paul told Timothy, watch your life and your doctrine. Watch what you say and what you and what you teach, because you'll save yourself and those who hear you. In other words, be careful. Right. James says not many of us should be teachers. Right. We're going to have to give a stricter judgment for those who teach. So I got to stand before Christ and give an account for this. And so I said, all right, if that's the rule, then I'm going all in. I'm, you, I can't have to do this because he gave me a gift to teach and to preach and evangelize. And I can't not use that. I can't bury that in the sand. So I got to go and study. I got to go study. I got to be diligent. And I got to preach the word. And I'm OK. I'm OK. And it's funny. When Paul charged Timothy, he always charged them by the father and the son. Never a third person. Mm -hmm. I charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead. Never a third person on those charges. Uh, and he gives multiple charges, at least three charges. He never does a threefold charge. But what's interesting is when he says, I charge you, what he's saying is you're going to give an account, Timothy. I'm going to give an account. Peter's going to give an account. And I said, if I'm going to give an account to Christ, then he's the only one's opinion that, I, that matters to me. And hey, and, and by the way, Matthew chapter 23, every Bonitarian should memorize that chapter where Jesus says, hey, do not be called rabbis. 
for you have one teacher to Christ and, 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 and call no one on earth father for you have one father who is in heaven and do not be called instructor because you have one teacher the Christ. Now, what's interesting about that? That's a threefold statement, but he's only got two heads there. He doesn't have he doesn't have like uh, three. Right. Yeah. He begins with himself. He ends with himself. He has the father in between. And he ends it by saying, you are all brothers. I don't call these guys church fathers. I do not call them church fathers because of that passage. That means they would be above us. At best, they're my brothers. Some of them I'm a little bit questioned about. I don't know if I want to be the brother of some of them, especially when they're doing some political stuff that was really rough. Right. I mean, I'm talking about like some people were actually trying to kill other folks in the name of their doctrine. I mean, I don't know about you, but I've read the Bible a lot of times. That doesn't seem to me to be uh, the way you get the doctrine across the line. Exactly. But my point is, when I look at Christ, he says, I'm your rabbi. I'm your rabbi. God's your father. Don't call those guys father. At best, they're your brothers. And if they're your brothers, have a family debate. I'll pick up Basil. I'll pick up Robert Lethem. I'll pick up Tertullian. And I'll read them. I'll give them the respect. To say, all right, you're a Christian. Are you claim to profess Christ? I'm going to hear your arguments out, but I'm also going to refute them like I would do my brothers on this earth. And if you're wrong, you're wrong because I'm going based off of the word. That, that's the only way I see how you can do that as a Christian is being the holding the Bible in one hand and holding what they're saying with a loose hand to examine it. And if it doesn't line up, like Paul says, hold on to what's good, discard what is not. I, I, I try to do that. <laughs> try to, you know have a discussion like when i first came out of the catholic faith mm -hmm. and into the biblical faith and people started asking me questions these are family members and mm -hmm. i told them what i believed in and i had at one time a room of 30 people wow. screaming at me yet they couldn't defend their position because they just accepted what they believed in the catholic church mm -hmm. and they defended it even though they've never read a page isn't mm. that interesting that you find that people defend their beliefs even though they've never read a page of the scriptures it, it's it's emotionalism it's emotionalism yeah. and, and tradition by the way tradition has that impact on people that's why jesus says you said you said new wine yeah. is for new wine skins it's not it's it's, it's, it's when, we, when we're talking and we're walking through they can't hear cry and by the way you know like i said my, my, my when i was younger when i first you know before i was a volunteer i just studied i just kept reading and rereading studying and restudying and like I said, I, I stopped believing the Trinity because of me trying to prove it from the scriptures. And I, I was left with scripture and the Trinity was not there. So, hey, yeah. that, that's why I said that that's ultimately if, it. And by the way, people are lazy. They don't want to read. And I find that we have more access to Bibles and resources now than any generation. We can look at original languages. We can get into the text. We can we can see competing views and we're going to be held accountable for that because we're, we're, we're swimming in riches that yeah. the early church didn't have. And we're going to be asked, did you study with all? And, and, and by the way, we can't say we don't, you know, we, we're sitting here streaming, you know, eight hours of nonsense and we got God's word. there getting dusty. Uh, there's no excuse. And so I say the reason why a lot of these arguments don't land with people is because they're really not reading the word. And uh, it's kind of like Josiah's day that, you know, the, 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 you know, the book of the law was hidden somewhere hidden and they, the, they had to go temple, find yeah. it. And we found it. They were crying. <laughs> they were crying because they were like, oh, man, you know, we heard about this, but, you know, we clearly weren't doing this. And so I feel that in one sense, you know, that's kind of, you know, like I said, they, they have the, the, the Bible today, but there's a lot of biblical illiteracy. And I think that's how people keep you trapped in tradition. And especially with the Internet now, I mean, there's no excuse. We're swimming in riches literature when it comes hey, to you, literature. You got monetarians like you and me on. You, we, 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 we can. Uh, <laughs> exactly. As you, say, as you say on your channel, we, we, you, you can address all those uh, mis misconceptions, uh, biblical mis oh, misconceptions. Yeah, so. my Bible misconception <laughs> program. Well. A lot of people like them, you know, because I go through the hard scriptures and give them the explanations for it, and they can just take it for what it is. They can either believe it or don't believe it. You know, it's really up to them. But I, I think I stick to the scriptures when I'm explaining it. I try and keep it in context, show the Greek, show the Hebrew, and mm. uh, a lot of people love it. So I, I'm glad mm. to do it. Um, hey. I want to read you an explanation of the Trinity from a Trinitarian apologist, uh, Robert Bowman Jr. Do you know him? Oh, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm very familiar with him. Oh, okay. Now I he's, would love to this debate him. If, I, if, he, if, he, if, he, if he listens to this video, I would love to debate him, actually. Um, <laughs> okay, he's really I good, hope so. actually. He's, he's really well, good. he I says this. Like I don't know how good he is, because he says this in his book, Why You Should Believe in the Trinity, page 12 and 13. He says, mm. 
Another aspect of God's oneness is the fact that they, there are no separations or divisions or partitions in God. The Trinitarian doctrine holds that, a, that God is a single infinite being, transcending the bounds of space and time, having no body, which is interesting because the Bible plainly says that God has a spirit body, but he has no body, either material or spiritual. And then he says, thus the Trinitarian God has no parts. You cannot divide infinite being into components. The Athanasian Creed, notice he says the Athanasian Creed, not the Bible, affirms <laughs> that God is not divided by the three persons when it states that the Trinitarian faith does not allow for the dividing of the substance, using substance meaning the essence or being of God. The three persons, consequently, are not three parts of God, but three personal distinctions within God, each of whom is fully God. Now, I don't know, when I read a statement like that, it's like kind of like the pinball machine goes tilt. And you're just kind of <laughs> left, you're just kind of left still wondering, you know, who, what is God? When you hear explanations like that, like, what do you think of this, something like that? Yeah, you got that right. Game over, man. Definitely on tilt there. Um, <laughs> And you're not getting your money back <laughs> from the Bowman book. By the way, I've read that book. Um, I, I would love to, tech, to challenge him on a number of points like that. You're spot on. Um, let, 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 let's, let me just say this. The moment you leave the confines of Scripture, you really have no boundaries. And Trinitarians will disagree with Trinitarians. The view that he's espousing now, I can go back and I can show you ancient Trinitarians that he would address as Trinitarians who don't believe that, right? There, there's always been a lot of variety in their beliefs. And obviously each one kind of comes out, you know, different ways, right? Even between the East and the West, a lot of people forget this, right? Right now today, right? Right now today, I'm talking about the theologians in the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox. They're not on the same page when it comes to the Trinity on all aspects of it, right? They'll say, you know, you know in a superficial way, but when we start pulling at that, that falls apart. Uh, Bowman's whole point there is this. He's attempting to do what the Bible says we shouldn't do, which is go beyond what is written. Right. All of the language that he's using there and the concepts he's bringing up there. No one says that. No one in the Bible sits down. I do believe, you know, like Jesus said, no one's seen God's form, his substance, except him. Right. The one who descended. Jesus saw. Him. Jesus saw the father. Right. Now. He did, I, I, I'm not going to draw a picture because I, I don't do that. <laughs> but, uh, but, but what I will say is this. God, I do believe God is infinite. And I do believe that God is spirit. I won't go beyond more than that. I'll say God's spirit. When I say God is spirit, I believe God, is, that means that God is life. It's talking about his very life. Because you see clay passages in the Bible where spirit of life, our spirit is equated with God's life. It's, it's, and, and I think one theologian said it's his empowering presence. God, mm -hmm. right? And I believe... Right. And I cannot fully explain because Jesus didn't. I can't sit there and explain, well, the Father is this, this. No, no, no. Jesus, like you said, they're one. And I believe they're perfectly one. In fact, Jesus even uses that word. May they be one even as we are one. And I believe they're so, they're so united as one, like you said earlier. When you see Jesus, you've seen God. If you want to know what God looks like, he's seated at the right hand. And he's coming back in glory, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and he's going to reign and rule, right? And we will see God. The Bible promises us that, right? Blessed are the pure in spirit, for they shall see God, right? Yeah. Um, so, so, and like you said, Jesus said to, to, to Philip and him, he said, like, have I been with you so long? And have you not known me? Now, that's not him saying I am the father. But like John says in chapter one, that Bonitarian book, he says, no one has seen God, but the one and only, the monogonese. And you said that correctly, the monogonese. Who is in his father's bosom? <sighs> Talk about relationship. Jesus came from the bosom of the father, like right here. He has made him known. Yeah, that's it. And so, and so, he came in the Old Testament. It says that he, his descendant is from eternity. He comes believe, from eternity. I believe. I believe, in, I believe uh, the I book believe of Micah, he, the fifth chapter. Yeah, he's always been there. And, and what I'll say is this: um, when you start to look at those two, that that family relationship. You don't you don't have to get into all of this philosophical categories and stuff that they're doing. Like they're coming up with the word that they the way they use person is different than the way it originally was used, especially in the scripture in Hebrews chapter one, verse three. So they that was the letter that Basil wrote to get people to stop using it that way because he wanted them to use it the way that Bowman is using it, uh, which is not not biblical. By the way, he can't show you a passage where he uses that word. Uh, and it's a it's a beautiful word. Um, 
uh, hypostasis, right? Um, the hypostasis. It's a beautiful word, yeah, but it means yeah. God's, yeah, God's very being, his very nature. It's, it's right. the underpinnings, right? It actually, the word hupo and stasis means stand under. Like we said, I understand something. It means I have a, I have a full grasp of what it is, right? Underneath it, not just superficially, but what it is. And he's the exact representation of God's hypostasis, right? His under, the very underpin, underpinnings of God, right? And so that's rich. That's how to write. And he calls them the outshining of his glory. Now that, that's biblical language. What they're doing is they're, they're using all of these traditional categories to try to explain something. And I've often said, it doesn't make sense. You, they do survey after survey, poll after poll of Trinitarians. And you ask them and they say they don't understand it. And the reason I say, the reason why you cannot make sense of the Trinity from the Bible is nobody made sense of the Trinity in the Bible. When I talk about resurrection, I can go to 1 Corinthians 15. When I talk about judgment, I go to John 5. When I talk about, you know, the death of Christ on the cross, I can go to these chapters, right? Why? Because someone said, whoa, 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 we got to write this down. Like Peter said, I, I, I got to make, I got to take an effort to make sure that you have this after, after I leave, right? You know, after I, you know, after I die. And my, my point is no one sat down and said, we got to, and this is the most important revelation. We got to make sure that people are worshiping correctly, Right. And they didn't sit down and do that for the Trinity. They did it over and over again for the Father and the Son. And so my point is, is, is Bowman, as well, a lot of these theologians are trying to make up for what the Bible never provides. And, and you, we talked about clarity earlier. Early. I, I have a definition um, in my book where I say clarity requires specificity. You've never had clarity without specificity, whether it be visually, audibly, objectively. It always requires specificity. They don't have and specificity requires specifics. There's nothing that specifically teaches that there are three persons within one divine being, knowing, loving, honoring, and co-indwelling each other. Perichoresis, as they call it. That's another word. It's not in the scripture. But you have <laughs> the Father and the Son. Believe, like Jesus says in John chapter 14, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, the God, definitive God. Believe also in God me. Then he says later, verse 10 and 11, believe you not that I am in my father and the father is in me, or I less believe because of the works themselves, right? And so you don't have that for the threefold nature. And so my argument is, let's just stay. And by the way, this is what's powerful about bonitarianism. We talk about strengths and weakness. Here's a strength of bonitarianism. Our view has been there all along, right? Like I said, Trinitarians like to defend the deity of Christ. So they've always defended the deity of Christ and the distinction between him and the father. So we've always been at the table, right? Our views have always been, in fact, that's the best arguments that they have are, are bonitarian, right? Uh, we should charge them taxes on that, right? But, but what, what, what we find is when we go to the Bible, the Bible itself, that's the clearest language. Like we, we quoted John 1. There's no John 1 and 1 for the Trinity. There's no John 17 for the Trinity. Look, read John 17. Read John 17 from verse 1 all the way down to the end and show me the Trinity. And Jesus never once does it. We have it. Like I said, we have it in abundance. And so what they're trying to do is, and I will just add one last point here. They use intimidation tactics. They, should, they use this very sophisticated language that they cannot yeah. simplify. And then they intimidate you and they say, hey, you can't understand it. They tell you that. You can't understand it. I and if you try to understand Robert it, Moore, yeah. Yeah, you might lose your mind if you try to understand it. The classic quotation from Augustine and, and others, right? Yeah. But what, what they then do, they tell you, you must believe it. And here's the thing. People, people are real easy to intimidate. They just say, well, you know, I, don't want, I, don't, I want eternal life. I don't know about you, Peter, but I want eternal life. I'm not doing this for nothing, man. I want, I want eternal life. If you tell me that if I don't believe in the Trinity, I don't have eternal life, then okay, you know, I, and I look around at the crowd and I do my I do my counts of the numbers. I say, all right, most people do. I'm safe with the crowd. I'm going to ride the curve. You know, God's going to grade on the curve. I'm good, and and it's it's not right. And and I say what they should do, and they don't have a verse anywhere to to put that mandate on anybody. And I and I've often said the Trinity without necessity lacks authority, and it doesn't have necessity because it lacks specificity. And so. I have confidence as a bonitarian. And I, and I know there are other people who feel this way. Uh, I get the emails. I got an email today. And they're like, you know, a guy says, hey, man, you know, I, I just know the Trinity is wrong. But, you know, you know, can you explain some more of what you're explain saying? Explain it to me. Explain it. A lot it. of people and, say that. And, and, and I tell you, and when we explain it, they hear it. And it's like, oh, that's that's all. You know, that's that's in the Bible. That's that's straightforward. Right. Um, and so I think more of us, as more of us do what we're doing tonight, um, you know, and in and, and, and broadcast like this, 
um, that people will see from around the world, right? They're going to have the confidence to say, and by the way, they'll come up with even more arguments. I, I find from my, uh, my, my, I know from my subscribers and uh, a lot of them are watching tonight, they come up with great arguments. And I'm like, I didn't think of that. That's a great argument. That's another point. And the more of us do that and the more of us stand our ground and say, no, you know, I'm not a Trinitarian. Uh, I'm not a Unitarian either. I'm, I'm a Bonitarian. And you don't have to say Bonitarian. That's that's just our label. But yeah, it's, we're in the father and the son, right? It's not like we said earlier that that word binitarian is not really passed around in Christian service. It's not that popular, that word. Right. But right. Uh, I mean, it's still viable. It's still it's a good, good word. word to use. But it, it gets, you know, it gets them asking questions. When The moment I use yeah. that word, everybody yeah. kind of pauses and says, well, wait a minute. Whether it be Unitarian or Trinitarian, they all pause and say, wait a minute. That sounds half right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting what you said about salvation and the Trinity. Here's from the Handbook of Christian Truth. It mm -hmm. says here, The mind of man cannot fully understand the mystery of the Trinity. He who would try to understand the mystery fully will lose his mind. But he, <laughs> but he who would deny the Trinity will lose his soul. <laughs> exactly what you said. <laughs> I, I, by the way, I agree with the first part, not the second one. <laughs> um, and by the way, whoever, wrote, whoever, whoever came up with this idea already lost their mind. Um, hmm. It's not in the Bible. And, um, yeah. and unfortunately, yeah. politics. And, and, and by the way, the Bible tells us don't put your trust in princes. Um, these, these guys, these guys, I, I, I've seen, like I said, I, I was part of that, you know, preacher class, you know, uh, you talk about the different kinds, right? Uh, there's, there's, there's the pastor kind as well and the preacher kind. And sometimes these guys, they want to sound authoritatively when you challenge them. And by the way, I, I, you, you had you, you had me beat a room of 30 people. I've, I've never been in that many. 30 <laughs> but, people uh, just screaming at uh, me. <laughs> I, I, I'll just leave that one to you. But I've, I've had to sit down with pastors in private before I wrote my book, before I did the YouTube and all this in the debates. I sat down in private with pastors and I said, let's go. Let's go through this. Genesis to Revelation. And Peter, that convinced me more mm. against the, the, the doctrine of the Trinity than anything, because these guys were standing up teaching and saying, I believe it. They said, told me I had to believe it. And I could just ask them questions like we've talked, just a sample of the questions that we've talked about. And, and they struggle. They struggle. I had a, I had a, had a guy who's a very respected leader. Uh, in my, uh, even to this day, I still respect him. But I asked him point blank. And they would, they would just ask me a lot of questions, by the way. That's how it usually works. They, 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 they feel you, they, you almost have to answer to them. There's a little bit of arrogance there. But finally, I got around to asking him a question. I said, hey, do you worship the Holy Spirit? If so, why? Show me a verse where you worship the Holy Spirit, you know, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I can show you why I worship the Father and the Son. And I quoted the usual passages, right, from Revelation, Philippians, Hebrews 1, Hebrews and 1. elsewhere. Um, and he didn't have an answer. In fact, he took months, months, and months. And he finally came back and he says, all right, Mario, I finally, I got an answer for your for your passage. And he says, and I said, I'm like, oh, I'm curious what, what is it going to be? And he says, oh, yeah, Matthew 28, 19, you know, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. He says, that's the verse that teaches me that I should worship the Holy Spirit as a third person. And first of all, I almost fell out of my chair because this guy's sharp. He knows the Greek. He knows the Hebrew. You know, he's a sharp guy. And I was like, you mean you never thought about this question before I asked you? Because you have, should have had a verse at the ready. But then I said, but after months, that's what that's the best one you came up with. And and he would he wouldn't but he said, Yeah, that's my verse. That's my verse. And I said to myself, I said, I will know I do not want to be in that position. When someone's gonna ask me why I believe what I believe, I'm gonna be quoting so many verses that um, you know, you're gonna be swimming in them and they're gonna be rightly handled. And so I would say, you know, when I hear someone like that, you know, who like I said, obviously because of tradition is holding his view and doesn't have a verse to defend what he's doing, then I, then, I, then I say to myself, then what can we expect of the person who's not as educated or thoughtful? They're, they're just going to, you know, they're just going to fold um, yeah. unless they, they wake up and say, you know what, let me give an account myself for what I believe and let me go study the scriptures. And I don't have to come up with something, you know, sophisticated. By the way, Basil used the exact same verse for his argument when he was asked the same question back in 381. So it, they've been doing it for, for a long time. And that, that's weak. That's the best verse that he has in uh, his book on Which, the Holy Spirit. For me, it doesn't prove the Trinity anyways, but, um, and I go through that in my Read. book with who, what is God. But anyways, is it safe to say, this is from a, an Anglican, that Anglican scholar I quoted to you earlier, Rawlinson. He says this about mm. the Holy Spirit. Uh, in the New Testament, there can be no doubt that the other strain of thought in which the Spirit is regarded in the, in the main as an influence, gift, or power 
sent by the Father and the Son, and not as a distinct person. He, uh, it says, large amounts of text represent the Spirit as an impersonal, impersonal force, both in Acts and Paul. Hmm. Is he accurate in that? This is a Trinitarian. Wow. Wow, <laughs> this is a good one. Um, so this is what I would say. This is what I would say. And 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 um, as you, you you're gonna expect me to say now, you, uh, it's in my book actually. Um, <laughs> I have this thing when I talk I talk about full spectrum view of the spirit, a full spectrum view of the spirit. The the answer to that question is yes, yes, and yes. Imagine a, a spectrum. We're gonna go from zero to a hundred, right? And and by the way, I shouldn't say zero to a hundred. Let's take all of the references to the divine spirit in the Bible. You're talking about 369, 369. That's that's law, prophets, writings, New Testament, 369, right? If we were to go through all 369, beginning with Moses all the way to Revelation, this is what you're going to find. 85%, in fact, slightly more than that, but let's be conservative. 85% of those are what I call objective references. What God is, what God gives, what God puts, pours, sends, you know, all of that objectively. Right. Eighty five percent. In fact, in the Old Testament, it's almost complete. All of the references are objective references. I use numbers 11 as one of the best examples because every Trinitarian struggles to try to get a subjective reference out of numbers 11, where God says to Moses, I will come down and I will take some of the spirit that is upon you and put it upon the 70 elders. Right. And they're struggling there because that's like, wait a minute, I'm going to take some of the person and put part of the person. It's clearly <laughs> being used. It's apportionment language. You quoted yeah. one of my other favorite verses, 1 John 4, 13, in the Greek text, in the Greek text, God says, I will abide. It's talking about the father. He said, he sent our son, he sent the son. And we know, we know that he abides in us because he has given to us from out of his own spirit. All of those words are there in the Greek text. There's no, that you can't duck them, you can't dodge them. Even the New English translation puts a note and says, this is apportionment. God gives us a portion of his spirit, right? Now, that's 85% of the time. The other 15%, there are subjective references, right? I'll give, I'll give a classic example that Trinitarians use all the time. Acts chapter 5. You have not lied to men. You have lied to God. Why is Satan so hard? Fills your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit, right? And you have not lied to men. You have lied to God. Peter there is using a parallel. But it's not what they use it for. They want to say, the Holy. this proves that the Holy Spirit is God. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. I, I guarantee you, any proof text of the Trinity always has Acts chapter 5, because they got to come up with some verse. Now, I believe it, that the Spirit is divine, because I believe that God is Spirit and God's Spirit is divine. We're talking about God's own Spirit. But what happens is, when you read Acts 5, and I think I may have lost you for a second here, Peter, but in Acts chapter 5, it's parallel. The God, which is always the Father in, in, in the book of Acts and Luke, is the Spirit. And we can go through other passages that make that point. So uh, we can say subjectively that God is the Holy Spirit, right? And it's used as a definitive title. And there's other passages I could use as parallel for that. The same can be said for Christ, uh, like in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the Lord is the Spirit. And so um, I would say a few percentage, 15% of those are used subjectively, where it's the Lord is the spirit or God is the spirit. And there's more proof that I can give. Most of the time it's God giving, pouring, sending, placing, putting his own spirit on his own people. And I'm not sure, but I think I may have lost uh, Peter here. <laughs> Ram, oh, okay. Okay. All right. You're back. You're back. Don't worry. Yes. I didn't, I didn't say anything, uh, Contrary. <laughs> Sorry, uh, my uh, my computer crashed. Oh, so all wow. of a sudden, I, oh, my screen wow. went blank. Uh, sorry about that, folks. Technology. Uh, technology. You recovered you recover well. Oh. <laughs> I, I kept the screen going. My, my last point, Peter, was that 15% of those references, a small percentage, 15% yeah. are subjective, like Acts 5. God is the Holy Spirit, right? And it's funny. We, we say God is spirit. God is holy. And, and a lot of Trinitarians, they laugh. They say it's simple. But I say it's so simple yeah. because it's sound. We call God the Holy One. We can call him the Holy Spirit. Jesus can pray to the Father and say, the Holy Father. In, in John 17, Holy Father, right? Um, in Matthew 10, verse 20, it talks about how the Spirit of your Father will give you what to say in our persecution. So we have no problem saying those things. And, and the same thing can be said for Christ. Second Corinthians yeah. 3, the Lord three. is the Spirit, right? Is that um, Spirit, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So I, and he he says it twice there. By the way, you ever want to get a Trinitarian on that passage? They, I, I've studied that passage Greek. I've gone to the Septuagint. I've looked it up and down. There is no room out. There's no wiggle room out of that passage. And, and you you can you can rarely find a Trinitarian who will debate that passage publicly. Uh, I've had them admit to me that my view or our view is the correct view or the view that's more defensible, but they will never say, I say, hey, can we have this publicly said? Can we say this in a debate? They will not let me quote them and they won't let me debate them publicly on that passage. But the Lord is the spirit. Um, and, and Paul says it similarly in 1 Corinthians 15, where, you know, Christ is a life-giving spirit. Um, and so my argument is 15% of them are subjective. Um, and like in Romans 8, the spirit intercedes. Well, I believe the spirit of Christ intercedes to the father. Only that same word is used for Christ later. Christ inter is at the right hand interceding for us. He's the intercessor. And the he, spirit the is the intercessor. Is. So it's obvious one and the same. The Lord it's is that one. spirit. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And so you have, we always have that interchange. You, you quoted one earlier about uh, Paul, you know, um, you know, well, Paul talks about God's spirit as his mind. When you go to first Corinthians chapter two or Romans chapter, you know, chapter 11, you see Paul using it. He has no problem talking about God's spirit is God's mind. And in first Corinthians two, he says, we have the mind of Christ. And so and he's quoting know, Isaiah. He's quoting uh, 40, Isaiah. 13. That's correct. You know? That's correct. And, and, and it's a direct substitution for spirit. When you, when you put them yeah. side by side in the Greek, you're like, oh my goodness. It's, he's saying mind of Christ is the same as spirit of the Lord. Spirit is mind. And we can obviously say God knows the mind of his son. He put the spirit of his son in us. And I also say we, we can talk about the spirit of the father because the father is not he's not left out, too. He says we will come and make our home. There's a we. Um, there's and, a we there. And it's interesting how you say how the father is the comforter. May the God mm -hmm. of all comfort and so on. Yet Jesus says, I will not leave you comfortless. I yeah. will come to you. He's the comforter. And it says that they make their abode with them. And it says in First John four thirteen and three twenty four mm. that they dwell in them by the Spirit, Amen. which He has given them. So and this is how they make their abode. Right. It's not on. Yeah, right it's, on. Right on. it's all right. By the way, said, what we just did just now, no Trinitarian can do that. Like 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 how we went and we 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 said and then we showed. We said and yeah. we showed. Right. And you you quote. By the way, every every pass you quoted there, I'm I'm on board. Exactly. Just, and we didn't, we didn't just, sit down and like corroborate here. Uh, yeah. You know, <laughs> you came to the same conclusions independently act like I did, but you searched out the scriptures. And so, right. yeah, spot on, spot on. You got and both. It, it, just roll, it just rolls off the tongue because you can just <laughs> sit there and go back and forth. And uh, spot on. But Peter, let me make one point here. This is a powerful one. I call it the pronoun argument, right? I got, I got a preposition argument and a pronoun. We talked about the father and the son dwelling in us. You could challenge them all day. They, they can come with all kinds of reasons why you don't have the Father, Son, and Spirit loving, knowing, and honoring each other. They can try to do Jonathan Edwards. They can do Augustine. It won't work. But here's something simple, right? It's all the Spirit. Spirit's trying to like not bring attention to himself. Here's the thing. That wouldn't stop the Father and the Son. All throughout the Bible, the Father and the Son, Old and New Testament, the law, prophets, and writings, and the New Testament, they use pronouns between the Father and the Son conversationally. The, the, like we quoted Hebrews, your throne, O God. That's the Father saying you, your. Um, Jesus can say, Father, glorify me. Thou glorify me in your own presence with the glory I had with you. In Greek, that you is singular. It's not plural. The Greek has a different word. I mean, has a different form of saying the plural versus the singular. They never do it. You can go through all of those pronouns. You is always singular between the Father and the Son, right? He never says they. He never says we like you know, the spirit and I, we are the father saying the spirit and I, we are going to empower the son. No, not once. Mm -hmm. Give me one. Just give me one reference. Whereas we can go through all of those pronouns. And my joke is our culture is confused about pronouns right now, but God's not. God's not. God yeah. knows his pronouns. And so there's no place. And, 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 and it's funny. People say Acts chapter 13, what the spirit says, set apart for me. So I said, OK, he can use pronouns. But where does he say the father and the son, we, that's all it would take. Are like are like God saying, "This is my beloved Son, whom I well please." Spirit, I want you to go and be with. He never addresses the Spirit as a direct address, you, but he does it to the the Son all day long. And in the same, a similar argument can be made with prepositions. There are, there there are few core prepositions that are used by the apostles to demonstrate that the Father and the Son are together in a relation. Like we quoted John one, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with. That's pros kan theon. That word pros means proximity. 
face to face with is some people would argue. Like when John says in first and second John, a uh, second and third John, I don't want to write to you in ink. I want to come and speak to you face to face. It's face pros face. I want to speak to you together, right? Yeah. The word pros is never applied to the son and the spirit, the father and the spirit, but it is the father and the son, right? In fact, it's even applied with us. Jesus said, I will come to you. I will come to you, pros to you. Uh, same thing can be said for para in the data when he talks about in John 17, a father glorify me with the glory, power that I had with you, power before the world began. Only use of the father, only use singular. He'll never use that power at all of the spirit in a data. Meta is the same way um, in in, like we talked about the father in the son and the son. You will never have a pat passage where the father and the son will be in each other and then they will be in the spirit. The problem is Trinitarians believe that all of those things are true pronouns, prepositions, they have claims about that, right? In 381, that big with, that, that, that's the word with, to glorify together with the Father and the Holy Spirit is to be glorified together with the Father and the Son. That's the word they wanted. They don't have a preposition anywhere that does what they did in that creed in the New Testament. That's locked. That's an ironclad. Those are two ironclad arguments in addition to the love, knowledge, and honor and worship that Trinitarians, they hear it and they just shrug. They yeah. just shrug. That's that's deep, Mara. That's deep. Um, Thank you. And I, I, had, I, had, I, had to, I had to drop that on you before we. Leave, <laughs> I want to give you some. Uh, yeah. I want to give you some ammunition. <laughs> <laughs> and, and back to the Comforter, like you said, mm. God confers part of Himself, the Spirit, and that's how He can dwell with us. I think Christians don't realize that when they have the Holy Spirit, it's actually a part of His very being. Is, mm. is dwelling inside you. This is how the Father and the Son dwells. Their hey, very being is inside you, the Spirit. Hey, Peter, can I do something here? Can I do something on your channel? I know I know. Uh, my first interview with you. I, may I show a screen on something? I want to show you something power, powerful from uh, okay. from the book of Acts. Okay. It's, I want to show a verse from the book of Acts. I want to just share my screen here. Hold on one second here. I'll, show, I'll, I'll share it if you don't mind. I want to show you something that once you see it, you can't unsee it. And no, no Trinitarian can. Um... I think I think oh. I know what you're going to show me. But I want to <laughs> see it anyways. <laughs> OK. And here here is I'm going to show this this screen here. This is just I'm just going to blue letter Bible here. Um, and let me know if you're able to. Um, oh, I think you got to add I'll, it into the uh, yeah, chat. I'll, yeah, I'll add it okay. in here. OK. Right, right. Oh, Let's do this. If we're going we're to we're put the nail in the coffin. Let's put the nail in the coffin here. Oh, here so this go. is okay. Acts chapter 2, Blue Letter Bible, right? Anyone can do this. Anyone can do this search, right? This is going to blow your mind. This is Pentecost. I've often said everybody talks about the Bible, but Pentecost is the proof. Whatever, Because remember, it comes down to, are we saying as a third person? Pentecost is the proof. Everything, like you said, he promised to pour out his power, his spirit, his presence upon them. Never a person, right? And there's so many passages in the in the Old Testament, New Testament that teach that. Here's Pentecost. This is Peter on the day of Pentecost going and explaining what's happening on Pentecost. And he goes and quotes the Old Testament. This is powerful. When you get down, and I won't read the whole thing, but I'll read the part where everybody's familiar with. Acts Beginning at Acts chapter 2, verse 16, down to verse 18. This is what he says. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. This is Peter def defending what's going on on the day of Pentecost, right? God had promised he was going to do this. He had demonstrated through the through having the uh, the feast, you know, always being represented throughout the history of Israel. And now on the day of Pentecost, appropriately, he's pouring out his spirit from his spirit. Now, notice this. In Acts, we have the Greek town. I'll just show you here, right? I'll show you, right? So it's going through the Greek text, and I won't go through all of this, right? But I want to just show you this one word here where it, it's very powerful, right? Where he comes and he says, this is God. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just hit the ver verbs here, right? And it shall be in the last days, and I'll, and I'll highlight it as I'm going across. He says, the God. Remember that the God I always talked about? That's that right there, hostel, yeah. os, right? But then here's a verb, ek keo, right? That's pour out. That's the word for pour out, ek keo, right? I will pour out. And here's a word here. It's a little small word. Let me make it big, right? It's a little small word here. Let me make it big. It's the Greek word, apa, apa, right? A-P-O, A-P-O. And let me bring it up here. And this word here, it overwhelmingly is translated as from, 
right? When you bring it up, and that's the Strong's, if you want to look up the Strong's, I know some people look at the Strong's, but you go and you look it up, overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, this word, like, look, when it's used in the Greek text, 393 times, it means from, or of, or out of, right? Now, here's what's powerful about this. This is not the only place where, where this is done, but when you read this text literally, right, in the last days, it, it shall be, God declares, I will pour out from my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. And then he says it again in the next verse. Right. Um, he says, and this will happen. Let me just scroll down here to get my uh, my text. But he says, even on my male and female servants in those days, I will pour. And he uses the word again, Apa, out from my spirit and they shall prophesy. I've challenged Trinitarian. I said, please explain to me why that's untranslated in this text. You'll see it translated a little bit in the King James, where they'll say, like, I will pour out of my spirit. Our of New American, spirit. Yeah. yeah, our New American Standard will say, uh, the 1995 edition will say, you know, I will pour out forth, um, I believe, forth of my spirit. But it is, it can be translated from. When we use that word, the a few other times in this chapter, it's translated as from other places in Acts chapter two. And it's from, it's, it's a simple little word. It's a simple little word. But the moment you use that, we all get the illustration. I will, if God tells you twice in this passage and elsewhere, by the way, it's not the only place he uses that. I will pour out from my spirit or out of my spirit, as it says in first John four thirteen. we all know what he means when he's saying that he's giving us, and you said it, he's giving us himself. The yeah. greatest gift that God can give us. He not only gave us his son, he gives us himself. And when he gives us himself, we have him present with us. Uh, I tell people, use that text. If you, you know, obviously I went through a little bit of Greek there, but you can, if you want to do some deep study, right? Go look up that little word, apa. It's right there. I will pour out from. There's no Trinitarian pastor or theologian can disagree that that's not in that text. And if it's in that text twice, on the day of Pentecost, Peter is saying, God has poured out from his spirit upon us. He's given us his spirit. And obviously he can later on speak personally. He can speak subjectively or objectively, however, however the context depends. And it could be like from his own being, his own heart, yes. his own mind. He's yes. pouring out his his very being to his, uh, his servants. That's incredible. That's an incredible Amen. passage. Amen. Mario. We've been at this for two hours. Can you believe it? <laughs> uh, the, very, 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 very appropriate for two bonitarians, right? Two yeah, hours, exactly. Right? <laughs> um, well, this was great. And uh, hopefully we can do this again. Mm. I want to thank Amen. you for coming on the live stream with us. Uh, I hope people learned a lot from this discussion that we had. Um, can you tell people if you have any links or a book you, that you're offering? Any sure, literature? sure. Actually, before I do that, Peter, I just want to say, man, you have been a great host, man. I really enjoy, I, I didn't even know it's been two hours. The conversation has gone. Uh, my, my, my wife and my family is not surprised. So you guys take a while when you get to you get together. Two bonitarians start talking about the word. It's going to be a while. But you've been such a gracious host, man, from, you know, from the invite until now. Uh, I really, I really appreciate you. I thank you. Um, and you just in this conversation has been very enjoyable, very stimulating. I would gladly come back. Um, and right. just to and thank you for allowing me to just give up my channel. My channel is Biblical Bonitarian. No surprise there. Um, you know, Biblical. You just put. In fact, if you just as my my one of my friends says, if you just put Bonitarian in in YouTube or in Google, you'll see. I think either you and I come up. <laughs> the two of us come <laughs> up. Um, but you'll see Biblical Bonitarian. I also have a website, BiblicalBonitarian.com, uh, and I'm okay. also on Facebook and on Instagram. Can you show your book that you wrote on oh, Biblical sure. Bonitarianism? <laughs> You're asking an author to show his book easily, and uh, it's on Amazon. Uh, it's I don't know how you if you can see it clearly here, but it's why I became a biblical bonitarian, Mario Shepherd. Um, it's on Amazon, and uh, I like to say I actually really like the book. Uh, it's 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 not uh, over your head. It's right here from the heart, and I just I explain you know what what were the things that led me to become a biblical bonitarian from the scripture, and I do respond to the most common passages that are raised by Trinitarians and Unitarians. And I, and I believe I do a very solid job, if I could say so myself. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Thank All you right, me. Mario, thank you very much for coming. And let's do it again. Let's keep in touch. Thank you, sir. Much appreciated. Okay, thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a good day. You too. All right. That was uh, Mario Shepard, the biblical binatarian. I hope uh, 
you found this uh, discussion uh, profitable, and hopefully you learned a lot from what we discussed here today. And of course, uh, we will continue to come up with uh, more biblical misconception videos on a lot of the Trinitarian arguments and even the arguments from Jehovah's Witnesses and give you the clear, the clear explanation of who, what God is. It's the duality of the Godhead, the family of God, of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit being their mind is what God is composed of. It's God's very being. And that's who, what is God, the case for biblical binatarianism. Thanks, everybody, for joining me here on today's live stream, and I hope everybody has a wonderful day.